Dean Arnold Coral, the Candyman Killer, a Texas mama's boy who first made friends with local kids by handing out candy from his family's Houston candy store like an absolute cartoonishly creepy dirtbag. The man who then groomed a teen boy to be his murder, rape, and torture accomplice. He then convinced a second teen boy to also be his murder, rape, and torture accomplice, a second boy who would eventually shoot Dean dead, but not before Dean killed at least 28 Houston area teens between 1970 and 1973, most dying just about the worst death imaginable on his homemade torture board. We take a look today into the life and times and crimes of someone who initially did not seem destined for a life of sadism and debauchery. His mom opened a family candy store for God's sake. Despite no history of suffering abuse himself, Dean developed a dark talent for manipulating and abusing others. Over the course of this podcast, I become pretty jaded towards true crime, but this story really pulled me in. It has some strange twists and turns in it, and a happy ending in the sense that the bad guy eventually does get killed. Not as good as the bad guy you know, dying before becoming a really bad guy, but a lot better than him getting away with it, and, and a little more satisfying than him just hanging around watching TV in prison right now. Murder, torture, abduction, and some super sketchy early 1970s Texas police work all examined today in another true crime edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Time Suckers. Hail Nimrod. Hail Lucifina. Praise Bojangles, Triple M. I'm Dan Cummins, a.k.a. the Lord and Master of all Suckdom. The Master Sucker and you are listening to Time Suck. Welcome back to a somewhat normal log entry into the annals of the cult of the curious. The last suck was something else, right? Uh, apologies right off the bat for the aggressive air banjoing. So many air banjo solos. So loud. Uh, just know that I know how annoying that was. Whiskey, man. Gets me all riled up. Uh, sorry for all the yelling. So much yelling. Uh, I did have a great time, though. Uh, thank Nimrod. Lindsay was there to help me finish the tale. Uh, thanks again for, for Joe Paisley coming in late to work, for the 10-6 crew catering and supplying the booze. Uh, recorded in the Suck Dungeon in CDA Idaho uh, today, Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley at the production helm, Lindsay in studio as well, Kyler Moreau at Sleepaway Camp, Penny Pooper and Gigi Bell possibly currently destroying something I care about. Uh, kidding, they're actually uh, very good dogs. I recorded this in advance of my Chicago shows, so, so hoping, uh, you know, those were awesome. Uh, now that you'll be hearing this after those shows. Uh, already hoping I never do three shows of stand-up on a Saturday uh, <laughs> uh, again, even if all three shows were fun. Too many shows for one day. And I did have a great time in uh, West Palm, for sure, now that that uh, has officially happened in my, in, my, in my life. Now, since these things are recorded a little out of order sometimes. And, uh, and, and I have some Time Sucker updates, just so you know, at the end of the show, uh, about, you know, kind of feedback from the drunk suck. I know it was a hit for many. Uh, not as much for some, and I appreciate all the feedback. And but for the most part, everybody really, uh, really loved the uh, the difference there. Just kind of sh- shaking things up a bit. Uh, really hoping to see a bunch of you in a Denver at Comedy Works downtown for the Flat Earth tour this weekend. Really, really hope I see a ton of you on Sunday for the live Narco Satanist suck. Adolfo Constanzo, mulleted leather jacket wearing leader of a group of satanic drug dealers who sacrificed random people they kidnapped, uh, sacrificed them to the devil. In exchange, exchange for what they thought was uh, magical powers, drank potions and shit, uh, to, you know, w- wove spells. Cassanzo uh, had his followers uh, thinking thinking they were invisible, thinking his potions made him invisible, amongst many, many other crazy things that we're going to dive into at the live show only. Hey, Lucifina. Also uh, in Colorado, Fort Collins, Colorado, Tuesday, August 21st from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., uh, our friends at Max Line Brewing are hosting a Time Suck Trivia Night. How fun is that? Giving away goodies, too. For the winners, teams can be anywhere from one to five players. Some of the topics are Golden State Killer, Aztec Empire, Chikatilo, Lost Books of the Bible. Uh, I'll have a link in the episode description to a, to a Facebook post with the full details, and that's at 2724 McClellan Drive. So make it a fucking week, Colorado suckers. And, and then I head back to the Bay Area, Sunnyvale, California, nerd capital of the United States. Uh, you know, v- very close to, well, close to the nerd capital, that, that area, close to Cupertino, Apple's headquarters. I'll be at Rooster Tea Feather September 6th to the 9th, then south in Hollywood, California, at the Improv, one night only, September 12th. Love that club. Uh, just north of uh, Los Angeles and Oxnard, September 13th through the 15th. Also, uh, my new album, Maybe I'm the Problem, dropping soon on vinyl. 
My first ever vinyl pressings uh, on Romanus Records come out in a, in a few limited edition possibilities September 15th, noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Romanus Records, man, they specialize in custom vinyl. They're time suckers. The records they make look so good. Uh, usually just all indie rock and then and then me, so that's fun. Uh, very pumped to have that hit human hands and then, you know, human ears right after it hits the human hands. Uh, and there'll be a link to the uh, Romanus Records store in the episode description and, and pics of how these records will look, you know, will be posted on Instagram at, uh, at Dan Cummins Comedy so you can see, you know, just exactly what the, uh, what the vinyl is going to look like. Labor Day sale coming up as well. The Time Suck store. Man, got to get some of that exotic fabric out of here. Got to kick out some of the elderly moleskin. Get rid of some of that baby deer inner thigh skin. Uh, get rid of some of those hummingbird tail feathers. August 27th, uh, noon, uh, through September 3rd at noon, 25% off everything in the store and a free air freshener with every purchase. So you can so you can smell that suck. And it's going to be the last chance to grab a few items, uh, like the original Danger Brain Cult of the Curious shirt with the logo version of my face. Uh, last chance for that green lizard pullover hoodie. Last chance for the summer tank tops. Um, thanks for wearing that stuff to the shows too, by the way. It really, really means a lot. It's, it's so, uh, pumps me up to see that shit out in the crowd. Very, very, uh, grateful that you guys care enough to get it and to wear it and to come to the shows. Uh, following up on what I announced last week, uh, some sad and unfortunate news, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, Andrew Wood, as I, uh, I believe I said his name last week, possibly did not actually say his name, but Andrew Wood, space lizard, time sucker, took his own life Sunday, August 5th at the request of his family. As it should be, uh, the details of his suicide are being kept private. Just want to take a minute again to remind each and every one of you that you are never alone. Time Suck has become a second family for many of us. And while our family is uh, is dark and weird and we joke a lot, we, we do take suicide and all of life's challenges seriously. And as I said last week, we, we are donating some of the spaces or Patreon support this month to the Suicide Prevention Lifeline in Andrew's name and honor. And again, that number is 1-800-273-TALK. 1-800-273-8255. Link in the episode description for that. Don't hesitate to call that number if you need to. Nimrod, he wants you to. Lucifina, she thinks it's brave and sexy for you to call and get help if you need it. Take care of yourselves, time suckers. And, uh, and now, time to dive into someone who Nimrod did not want to take care of himself. Uh, Real-life monster, God, Dean Arnold Coral, Houston's notorious Candyman killer. Like the Toy Box Killer, uh, like Andre, uh, what is big deal? Chikatilo, I can't believe I'd never heard of the Candyman prior to this year. I guess I, I guess prior to this podcast, I wasn't as much of a true crime nerd as I thought it was. Uh, when uh, he died in 1973, the Candyman was deemed to be America's most prolific serial killer. He took almost uh, 30 teen boys that we know of off the streets of Houston, and, and his crimes though received surprisingly little national press. Further surprising me is that the kids he took weren't kids kind of uh, out there walking the streets. Not that that would make it, you know, remotely acceptable. It's not about, the, it's just that, you know, uh, they weren't like at-risk youth, which is atypical. A lot of the kids he, you know, took were from happy homes. You know, and again, usually predators like that prey on kids, you know, without families or with families who are less likely to look harder into their disappearances, kids who have already run away. He wasn't, he wasn't taking runaways. He wasn't taking teen prostitutes. He was taking kids from totally kind of normal working class homes. Uh, unlike, you know, like Gacy, uh, John Wayne Gacy, the Candyman took kids who were, you know, just going out to watch a movie with a girlfriend, kids who were just riding their bikes around the neighborhood, walking home from work, maybe looking to have a few beers, smoke a little weed with a few kids uh, their own age. And, and a couple of kids their own age um, uh, that they were, you know, sometimes going to hang out with were, were kids they often knew from school in the neighborhood, kids who then talked them into meeting up with Dean, the Candyman, which also makes him unique as these, these teen accomplices. You know, these kids would talk him into either getting into Dean's van or, or meeting back at uh, Dean's place to party. And then within hours or even minutes of meeting Dean, they found themselves tied to his torture board, being raped, tortured, humiliated in preposterously sadistic ways. And then in almost every case, they found themselves, you know, soon also being murdered. The real Candyman, way scarier than the movie version uh, that I watched back when I was a freshman in high school, Sam River High, Go Savages, uh, back in 1992. And that dude was scary. Uh, let's start at the beginning today with the Candyman, back when a monster appeared to be just a sweet little newborn baby in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. Dean Arnold Coral, born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, on Christmas Eve, 1939. 
Christmas Eve, Halloween, would be so much more fitting. Uh, he's the first child born to Mary Robinson and Arnold Edwin Coral. He was shy. His mother doted on him. His father was supposedly strict, and according to someone close in the family, he did not appreciate children. Not a not a great dad quality. But I guess there was, I feel like there was probably a fair amount of that uh, back in like the 40s and stuff. I feel like there wasn't a lot of warm dads back then. Um, Fort Wayne, man, there used to be a comedy club in Fort Wayne. Uh, notorious dump of a club. It's no longer there. I never worked it, but I did stop by. That's what I think of every time I hear Fort Wayne. I stopped by and I watched a show one night years ago with another comic. I was touring some colleges in the Midwest, had a night off. Me and this other comic who uh, long since has quit comedy, we played a game of what we called hack bingo in the back of the room, which was such a dick thing to do. We made a three-by-three mini bingo grid and filled each of the nine squares with something we considered to be hacky in comedy, you know, like uh, something unoriginal or, or pandering that a lot of comics, you know, would do. Like, you know, one square might be, uh, let's give a round of applause for our troops, uh, which is a nice thing to do. But shitty comics who could not get applause breaks off of actual comedic material uh, would do that just to make some noise in the room, <laughs> like just to get the audience on their side, whether they give a shit about troops or not. Uh, another square might be, right, ladies? You know, possibly followed by something effective like, you don't need a man when you got a dildo and a nice bottle of wine, right, ladies? Something corny like that, or or, or or just jokes that I'd heard a hundred different comics tell, like, this isn't a town. Man, this, this is a truck stop that got out of hand. Or, man, where, where y'all keep all the... And then just fill in the blank with any ethnicity not obviously represented in the crowd that night. Where do you, where do you keep them? Uh, the comics in Fort Wayne that night, not terribly original. I, th- I think we uh, won our game. One of us did in about 50 minutes. And that, that's my only real memory of Fort Wayne, of me being a judgy asshole at Snickers Comedy Club. Real name. Nine years, though, before the birth of Dean Corll in 1930, uh, you know, uh, shit was already really popping in Fort Wayne. You know, way before they had a comedy club, they were a bustling, hustling little city. Uh, that's that's when, uh, 1930s, when the 312-foot-high Lincoln Bank Tower was completed, Indiana's tallest building. It would remain the tallest building in, in, in Indiana until 1962. Uh, the Depression hit Fort Wayne, you know, not long before Dean's birth, like it did rest of America. But uh, FDR's New Deal put a lot of new jobs in Fort Wayne in the 30s and early 40s. 7,000 residents worked on the construction of parks, bridges, viaducts, modern sewage treatment facility. In the post-World War II years, uh, Fort Wayne would, would really start to boom. Uh, a second child, Dean's younger brother Stanley, born in Fort Wayne in 1942. Stanley would later go on to make a lot of money in the board game business. He would invent Yahtzee in 1966. Yahtzee! And Clue in 1971. And of course that's not true. Very little information about the life and times of Stanley Coral seems to exist online. We know he was born, and according to an obituary uh, obituary reference I found online, that, that he lived well into his senior years, into his 70s, and that's, that's about it. Thankfully, we do know a little more about Dean. Uh, Dean entered grade school in 1946, um, where his mom remembered him. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I – 1944. 1944, where his mom remembered him quickly becoming a target for bullies. He had a heart murmur that kept him from participating in, in gym class. He was sickly, especially after suffering from a bout of rheumatic fever when he was seven. He was a, he was a sickly mama's boy. I don't have any stats to back this up, but I feel like the sickly mama's boy way more likely to become a serial killer than the I got this, I don't need your help, ma, star athlete. You know, you know I hear uh, about a lot of young, popular alpha males, kids who can, you know, I don't know, clean their own wings. Mama Ridgeway reference for 10 points. You know, you don't hear about them sliding into sadistic murder later in life that I can think of. In 1946, now we're, now we're hitting 46. I got a little fucking excited about 1946 earlier. Dean's parents, Arnold and Mary, get divorced. Arnold moves to Memphis after he enters the Air Force. And then Mary and the two boys soon follow. She Mary's wanted the boys to be close to their father, even if the marriage had ended. Uh, and then there was clearly still romantic feelings as well, though, because they reconcile in Memphis. And then the family moves to Pasadena, Texas, where they get married again in 1950. Pasadena, uh, interesting trivia, a southern suburb of Houston that was later packed up and relocated by train to California in the single largest town relocation in American history. When Sears opened up a new shipping facility, a large one, and Sears didn't have the time to actually properly build a new town full of people to work there. So they just moved Pasadena to California to facilitate their, their gigantic warehouse. And that's, that's fucking crazy talk. But please tell me that some of you thought Sears once had that kind of pull, uh, that it actually moved a town across the country. <laughs> uh, no, nothing like that has ever happened that I know of. No, Pasadena is a suburb of Houston still. Has over 150,000 people living in there, uh, living in Pasadena now. Back in 1950, just over 20,000 people living in Pasadena. 
And a lot of those people were making that sweet oil money. Black gold, Texas tea, lightning juice, coal caviar, diamond whiskey, dirt booty. Black gold and Texas tea are the only legitimate oil nicknames I just yelled. I did make the rest of those up, but I do kind of like coal caviar. Maybe that'll stick now. Uh, the Texas oil boom began way back in 1901. By 1920, refineries popped up uh, in and around Pasadena. 1928, the town incorporated. Then NASA's Johnson Space Center opened up about 10, 15 miles outside of Pasadena in 1963, further diversifying the still primarily petroleum-based economy. So the Coral family, they moved uh, to another town and area, just like Fort Wayne, that was on the upswing, you know? So like Jefferson's just moving on up, moving on up. Um Other than a few moves and divorce, you know, young Dean, he's having a solid middle-class American childhood. And then in 1953, three years into their second marriage, Arnold and Mary divorced again. Now, the divorce was, by all accounts, amicable. Uh, Mary retained custody, and Arnold received visitation rights and did visit the kids. So, you know, uh, Dean, I I think still having a a fairly typical middle-class childhood. You know, a couple of divorces thrown in, but, you know, shit happens. Shortly after her divorce, Mary then meets and falls in love's Uh, falls in love with Jake West and then marries Jake West, a traveling clock salesman in either either 1953 or early 1904. I I swear to you, uh, this is what he did. I love details like this when sucking into a new story. A traveling clock salesman. Not just a clock salesman. That alone would be awesome and weird. Uh, That's not a job that exists anymore. Uh, A traveling clock salesman. And what a perfect name for, for that job, Jake West. Hello, ma'am. Sorry to bother you at home. Lovely home, by the way. I, I see you went with the mint for mica for the breakfast table. <laughs> Excellent touch. Name's Jake West. I work for the General Time Corporation. May I ask what kind of clock you and the mister keep time with? No clock. <laughs> oh, no, that just won't do. Is the mister home at the moment? No? Well, I... I won't trouble asking if I may come in, but if you do have a moment, uh, I'd like to show you a nice West Clocks pocket watch I imagine the mister would enjoy very much. And I insist that you take this catalog showing the vast and luxurious line of Seth Thomas, Elgin, Lux, and West Clocks wall clocks I am the only authorized retailer of in the entire Houston area. We just got in these wonderful new Roman numeral faces, and for something a little more modern, we're now carrying these glow dials. Ever notice the glow dial at the adorable little diner down the street? Perhaps the one inside the Texaco station. Yeah, yes, it, it's the same clock. Now available for the first time for residential use. And I and only I, Jake West, can get you 20% below manufacturer's suggested retail price. Well, <laughs> I can smell the casserole cooking. I don't want it to burn, so uh, I'll let you be, Mrs. Uh, what was it? Uh, Ryman. Uh, of course, Mrs. Ryman. I thank you for your time, ma'am. And if I'm able to add one of these wonderful time pieces to your life, soon you and your family will be thanking Jake West for my time. <laughs> okay, now. Sorry. I know that went on for a little bit, but those little flights of fancy make me so happy. He's a traveling clock salesman named Jake West. Oh, by the summer of 1954, Dean's mother, Mary, new stepdad, Jake West. Uh, yeah, they moved the family 90 miles east of Houston to Vider, Texas. Vider, small suburb of Beaumont, only about 10,000 people there, uh, who historically ha- have been mostly white, thanks to the town's very shady history as far as race relations go. Uh, Vider was known back when Dean's family moved there uh, as a sundown town. That's one of the towns in America where it was uh, made known uh, that African Americans not allowed to be out in public after sunset, like like they would be arrested and or lynched. Uh, Vider had a reputation as a safe haven for the Klan for many years. Uh, as recently as 1993, still super racist in Vider. That year, the federal government tried to help change the culture there of racial separation, brought in a handful of black families uh, into some public housing in Vider. Uh, in response, the Klan marched through town, and within months, uh, the new black families had moved back out. Yeah, I bet. Uh, man. 1955, Jake and Mary have a child together, Dean's half-sister Joyce, another sibling we know very little about. Kind of like uh, with the Green River Killers family. You know, Dean's family, not big on giving long interviews with the press after everybody knew what, uh, you know, what Dean had done. Uh, classmates from Vider, uh, from Vider High School would later remember Dean as a bit of a loner, otherwise well-behaved. Uh, he played the the trombone in the brass band like a future murderer would do. But other than playing Satan's slide whistle, pretty normal. Uh, classmates would also uh, remember Dean for being white, which, you know, uh, odds are probably made him, made him okay in their book, Inviter. Also in Little Old Vider, the family started making candy for real. This is, how, of course, what would lead directly to Dean's Candyman Killer moniker. Uh, Dean's mom, Mary, she likes to make candy. She loved making pralines. 
And apparently her pralines were so delicious that Jake West encouraged her to try to, uh, you know, let him sell some on his clock selling route. I shit you not. Fucking clocks and candy. Selling them door to door. What? That cannot be an easy way to make a living. Hello, Mrs. Mrs. Ryman. Uh, Jake West again. Uh, How's the Seth Thomas working out? Excellent. Polished brass Roman numerals on a solid mahogany body. You, you can't go wrong with that. You, yeah, you can't. In my humble opinion, truly a work of art on par with anything on display uh, in the finest New York City or, or Parisian museum. <laughs> I, I just popped over to make sure uh, you were still happy with it uh, and to drop off a little, little thank you gift uh, of, of the pecan prince pralines. No, 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 I insist. No, 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 I won't take a dime for them. But if you enjoy them, take this card. I'll be more than happy to sell you as many as you'd like at a fine price the next time I'm through the neighborhood. Life's too short not to take the time to enjoy something sweet. <laughs> Just be off now. How much do you hate fake Jake West? Ever had a praline, by the way? Uh, it's essentially just a chunk of butter, pecans, and brown sugar. Sometimes a little cream or vanilla extract or chocolate also thrown in, and I can't do it. I like, I like sweets. But that shit, that's like instant diabetic coma. Wow. Uh, I had some in New Orleans, uh, and then for like for that was the first time I'd had them, and then had to immediately eat something savory to bring my blood sugar back to a to a not dead human level. Uh, I, to be fair, I do have diabetes in my family, and I've been told uh, I better watch it, or I'll have diabetes as well by doctors. So, so I may be more sensitive to the sweets than most. But God, man, I don't know how people do pralines. Anyway, uh, Jake does start selling the pralines that Mary and the kids are, are making in the family garage. Starts selling so many, people love them. Uh, they call their little operation the Pecan Prince, and word spreads of how good it is and business booms. So how cool is that? Kicking off a candy company with your family in the garage becomes wildly popular. Such a shame this story ends tragically when it starts off so innocent and beautiful. Family candy business. Starting in the garage. You know, candy being sold by a traveling clock salesman. Oh, it's so like Americana. And then the whole family ends up being, uh, you know, uh, employed and doing well in Houston. Open up a few shops, and then Dean fucks it all up by becoming a just disgusting degenerate. Uh, 1958 Dean, uh, who's had what sounds to me, again, like, you know, pretty idyllic childhood, uh, graduates from Vider High School. And shortly after, uh, the family, including Dean, they, they all moved to the northern outskirts of Houston, where Jake had been selling most of his candy on his routes. And they open up a proper candy shop called, of course, the Pecan Prince. In 1960, Mary asked her son, Dean, to move back to Indiana to take care of his widowed grandmother on his father's side, which he does for two years before coming back to Houston to again help with the candy business. And, you know, damn it, again, Dean and his family sound fantastic up until this point. Running a successful and adorable family candy business, and then Dean heads back to Indiana to take care of sweet, sweet Nana. Such a good boy at this point. Uh, Privately, though, things are starting to unravel. Dean is clearly gay. He knows he's gay. His whole family knows he's gay, but no one wants to acknowledge it. Uh, He's gay in 1950s Southern Texas, which is a recipe for an arguably harder life than being uh, African-American in 1950s Southern Texas. In addition to being a pretty racist culture down there at the time, also an extremely homophobic culture. No one is cool with homosexuals other than other homosexuals. And it's hard to find other homosexuals when almost everyone openly really, really hates you. I mean, I mean, we're talking 1950s Southern Baptist culture. This is the type of culture Fred Phelps, you know, the, the former leader of the Westboro Baptist Church, you know, this is the stuff he considered the good old days. And Dean's mother, Mary, herself, especially homophobic, even for the time and uh, time and place. And she let Dean know it, would regularly tell him how disgusting homosexuals were, any chance she got. Maybe she thought her, you know, making her feelings about homosexuality well known to Dean could somehow kind of snuff out those homosexual inclinations she had to have noticed in him. All it did was push him towards, you know, self-loathing, to despise himself for the attractions he couldn't help but feel. Now, now did it also help lead to a rage he would later take out on teen boys? I mean, it might have helped. We'll never know for sure. In 1962, 22-year-old socially pressured to stay in the closet homosexual Dean Coral moves back to Houston after, I'm assuming, sweet, sweet Nana either dies or is put into a home. Uh, while he was in Indiana, the family business relocated to Houston Heights, a neighborhood in northwest central Houston, four miles northwest of downtown Based on what I can find online, with one travel reviewer calling it a mini Austin and others calling it a foodie destination, sounds like a little artsy, hipstery enclave, or at least uh, a neighborhood that has elements of that. It it would be described as being pretty run down by the late 70s, but in the 1960s, Houston Heights is banging. A lot of that candy money to be made. Uh, Dean lived in an apartment above the candy shop and quickly becomes known around town as the candy man for his habit of giving away candy to young boys in the neighborhood. Ding, ding, ding. Big red flag. 
super creepy. Fucking any dude, any single dude, just giving candy around to the kids all the time, big red flag. He also starts inviting local teen boys over to the candy factory after work, uh, after work hours to hang out with him. Ding, 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 ding. Much bigger red flag. Like super big, what the fuck is going on with this creep? Frantically being waved, red flag. If there's a dude in your neighborhood who just loves to hang out with a bunch of teen boys on a regular basis with no other grown-ups present, keep a very close eye on that shit. Interview those kids. Find out what's happening. Warn them about pervs. If you are that guy, come on, dude. Come on, bro. What are you doing? Why why aren't you hanging out with people your own age? Why don't you have at least a few other adults around? You have to know that at the very least, this looks really bad. Uh, Somehow, this activity apparently draws little suspicion in the neighborhood from the neighbors. However, at home, stepdad Jake West knew exactly what time it was. Clock salesman joke. Time to have a talk with the fam about Dean being a creep. Uh, Jake didn't think the associations were appropriate. Uh, told his wife he thought his stepson uh, might be gay, might also probably, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, be a uh, uh, you know, borderline pedophile or pedophile. She's furious, doesn't want to hear it, refuses to address it. Uh, also around the same time, a girl Dean is dating asks him to marry her, and he turns her down. You know? And then you know, stepdad Jake is like, come on, Mary, wake up and smell the young dick that Dean also wants to smell. Uh, Jake's suspicions of Dean being gay lead to, or at least have a lot to do with he and Mary then getting a divorce in 1963. And also in 1963, after her divorce, Mary closes her candy company. The pecan prince is gone and she only closes it so she can reopen without Jake West. She wants to cut out that clock selling truth telling son of a bitch. Uh, Dean's not a pedophile, Jake. He just likes luring teen boys into his lair with candy to hang out and play peekaboo with their weens. Uh, Mary reopens as the Coral Candy Company. Dean is now the vice president of operations and the CEO of creepiness. Uh, Shortly after reopening, a young teenage employee tells Mary that her son, Dean, has made sexual advances towards him. And again, rather than deal with Dean's homosexuality and probable uh, pedophilia uh, predispositions at this point, she instead fires the boy and brushes the incident away. Well, then in 1964, Dean decides he needs a break from mama and, uh, and bother some accusations, and he joins the United States Army. Attends basic training in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Later ends up in Fort Hood, Texas, uh, where uh, where he works as a radio repairman. But then he applies for a hardship discharge after serving less than a year, saying his mother needs him to help work in the family business. This is the biggest mama's boy reason I can think of to leave the Army. I, I can't stay here, Sergeant. I can't. Mama needs me to come home and help make the candy. Uh, so mama's boy who desperately needs to be around his mama uh, whose mama refuses to believe that he is gay. This is not a good psychological situation. Really, really bad one. Very Ed Gein-esque. Uh, if there was a time suck serial killer bingo, somebody would have yelled it uh, on the Candyman by now. He's, he's checking off a lot of boxes. Uh, and again, this makes me wonder, if mama had somehow accepted him, would he have become the monster he became? I have to think there's a decent chance he wouldn't. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess also, the, the, to be fair to Mama, even if she you know, would have been some remarkably progressive, tolerant, loving, open-minded woman, she still would have had a gay son in Houston in the 1950s and then, and then 60s. He, he still would have been ridiculed probably publicly. You know, May still have became the monster he became. And, and, and also, there's a whole another issue. Even if everyone accepted his homosexuality, that's not the, that's not the problem. Uh, the problem is the age of the people he's attracted to. He's not, he's not attracted to adult men. He, he's attracted to boys, to underage boys. And, and there may have just been other twisted shit in his head that was sending him towards becoming an evil, sadistic fuck of a person that no amount of acceptance from either his family or his culture around him could, could cure. You know, at the end of the day, he, he still chose of his own free will to commit the terrible deeds he did. Well, Dean received an honorable discharge less than a year after entering the military, you know, to help mama make the candy. And he, uh, then he comes home, he finally tells some of his closest friends that, that he is gay and, and that he had a couple of homosexual encounters in the military. However, he doesn't actually publicly come out as gay. Instead, he starts dating a woman named Betty who has two kids. Kids start calling him daddy. Poor Betty. Poor Betty's kids. This, again, reminds me of John Wayne Gacy's kind of story. He finds a beard to hide who he really was. Not, not healthy. Not healthy at all. 1967, Dean formed the first known relationship that would actually lead to pedophilia. For sure, a relationship with 12-year-old local boy David Owen Brooks, a dude whose story would become forever tragically intertwined with Dean Corls. A kid whose childhood the Candyman would destroy, whose adulthood the Candyman would imprison. David was one of the many local kids that Dean the Candyman would give free candy to. He was in sixth grade. 
His divorced parents had little time for him. He, he was a goofy-looking kid, real skinny with glasses. Coral was the first man to treat him decently. Brooks had met Coral at the family's new candy factory that sat across the street from Helms Elementary School, where he came to uh, play pool on a pool table Coral had, had installed so employees and local youth could hang out. How creepy is this location, by the way? Candy factory across the street from a grade school. I have to think that when this location was chosen, Dean was the one who scouted it out and pushed for it. You know? How about this spot, Mama? We can have such a nice view. Uh, of what, Dean? A swing set? Of, of all our potential customers, Mama. Of all those, those sexy kids. What did you just say, Dean? Did you just call those kids sexy? No, smiling kids, Mama. I meant to say smiling kids, Mama. Just happy after buying so much of your delicious cock. A, a candy, Mama. Uh, also, the pool table slash clubhouse detail reminds me so much of Gacy. Man, suck 68. Remember when we talked about Gacy? About how he had a pool table in his basement. He would invite teens who worked for him at KFC. Remember, he was managing those KFCs for his, for his father-in-law at the time. He'd invite him over to his house, head down to the basement for pool, porn, and beer. And then he'd make weird bets with them, like, uh, if you can beat me in pool, I'll, I'll give you a blowjob. Low <laughs> Fuck. Well, around the same time, Dean was doing the same uh, type of shit in Texas. Poor young David made the perfect target for Dean. You know, young boy's parents didn't either mind that he was hanging out with the creepy candy man or didn't check on him enough to know he was hanging out with the creepy candy man. My son Kyler's 12. And, and Lindsay and I, uh, you know, have him and Monroe at our house every other week and uh, for the week. And, and we would never, ever let him hang out with the grown man like that. Get the fuck out of here. And his mom wouldn't either. I would go ballistic if that happened. Man, keep an eye on your kids or make sure someone, you know, you really trust, keep an eye on them. I, I know that doesn't guarantee that something bad won't happen to them, but it, it increases the odds that they will be safe. It for sure does. Well, no one's watching out for David other than Dean, who soon started grooming the boy to be his partner in some unbelievably deviant crimes. Man, over time, Dean became a substitute father of sorts for Brooks, giving him money when he was short on cash, allowing him to crash his apartment when he needed a place to stay. Unlike a dad... Unlike at least a good dad, at some point in 1969, Dean starts pressuring David to have a sexual relationship with him. Starts giving the 14-year-old Brooks money and other gifts in exchange for allowing him to perform oral sex on David. Again, very Gacy-esque. Around this time, on either 69 or 70, Coral's mother closes the candy store, moves to Colorado. Uh, she made her candy money. She's probably sick of trying to pretend that, you know, son Dean's not a fucking pedophilia, you know, pedophile creep, and, and she's out. No, no more free candy for the candy man to dish out, but the nickname is stuck by this point. Coral doesn't follow Mama to Colorado. He stays in Houston Heights, gets a job as a relay tester at the Houston Lighting and Power Company. Now, he's, he's, he's set down some roots here. He's, he's, been, he's been grooming, you know, poor David. He's got some plans. Dark sexual fantasies really beginning to take hold of Dean. Pretty soon, he's paying an awkward, skinny 14-year-old kid, you know, to, to blow him isn't deviant enough for him. Uh, David finds out exactly how deviant Dean really is becoming in 1970. In late 1970, now 15-year-old David Brooks walks into a horrifying scene in Dean's Houston apartment. And his decision regarding how to react to this scene would ruin his and so many other young boys' lives. The Candyman had two naked teenage boys handcuffed and tied to what would become known as Dean's torture board. And he was in the process of brutally raping them. In exchange for a silence, Dean Coral offered to buy Brooks a green Chevy Corvette. Brooks would later tell police, Dean jumped up and said, I'm just having some fun. And he promised me a car if I kept quiet. Later, he admitted to David, uh, Dean did, that he'd, he'd killed these kids. And, and then he bought the teen, uh, you know, bought David the, the promised Corvette in exchange for his silence. How, how much did this fuck David's head up? Man, taken in by a father figure who's super cool to you for the first few years, you know, somebody you meet when you're 12. The only adult who gives a shit about you. Then after you love this guy like a like a dad, he starts molesting you, starts paying you for your silence, money you you appreciate, you know, because your real neglectful family is, is is super poor. Then after months and months of that type of manipulation and molestation, you walk in on this, a party you know you should call the police, but he assures you, despite what it may look like, that it's consensual. You know, I can see how you might think, well, you know, he's talked me into some weird shit. Maybe, maybe he he talked these kids into some weird shit. Maybe Dean's paying to use them as well. Then a short time later, you find out that those kids uh, actually were killed, kids that now you realize you could have saved. You're racked with guilt. You clearly do threaten to tell the cops. If you didn't, why else would Dean bribe you? You know, uh, the monster probably then convinces you that you're an accessory to the fact or after the fact of the murders, you know, tells you you're going to go to prison too if he gets caught. Then Dean makes David an offer, a true deal with the devil. The candy man promises Brooks $200 for any boy he could lure to his place. And then David accepts the offer. Fuck, man. I, I don't think your soul can ever come clean. Uh, after that, after that kind of deal, you can tell yourself, oh, you molested me, you manipulated me, I'm the victim, and, and you're right. 
but you, but you're also now forever the man who lured other teen de- te- or other teens, excuse me, knowingly to their deaths. Like, does any amount of counseling clean that that dirty of a conscience? M- maybe Dean made David think that he was gonna you know do it with or without David, and then if he got caught, he would, he'd take David down with him. Who, who knows? There is some other stuff he he told uh, uh, David that we'll talk about later. No matter what he told David, though, at the end of the day, it, it would be really hard to rationalize David's involvement and complicity in future murders. Quick word on Dean's torture board. Uh, this is a slab of unpainted plywood eight feet long and two feet wide with holes drilled into each corner. Coral would use the board by handcuffing a victim's hands to each top hole, binding their feet with nylon rope through the bottom holes. Uh, the board was a feature in almost every one of his murders. It was his signature, if you will, his, his toy box killer-like fantasy device. He moved it from home to home, storing it in, in plastic in back rooms filled with other torture, you know, instruments. Uh, once a victim was bound to the torture board, he might spend days torturing and molesting them. According to Wayne Henley, another one of Coral's teenage uh, accomplices we're going to meet here soon, the more Coral liked someone, the longer they stayed alive and were subjected to his sadism. Ugh. Uh, this, this, and, and this guy was like a, per- a precursor to both Gacy and the Toy Box Killer. Because his crimes, you know, predate those guys a little bit. Uh, well, predate, predate uh, Gacy a little bit, predate Toy Box a lot. Speaking again of Gacy, man, the, the Candyman and, and one of his victims would, would often use the handcuff trick to trap his victims to perform this, you know, trick, both Coral and an additional teenage helper, uh, usually usually Wayne Henley, uh, would lock themselves in, in a pair of handcuffs, keep a key in their pockets, then pretend they got out of the cuffs without any help. Then they would convince the victim to try locking themselves in the handcuffs to attempt the trick as well. And when that person couldn't escape, the victim had, just like many of Gacy's victims later on, handcuffed themselves and were ready to be taken to Dean's torture room and tied to the torture board. Gacy would actually later claim in Time Suck 68, uh, after getting caught in 1978, that he'd learned this trick from reading about Elmer Wayne, he- Elmer Wayne Henley using it. So a very sick Candyman to Gacy direct connection there. So, so who is this Henley dude? Well, he, he's Dean the Candyman Coral's second teenage accomplice. Elmer Wayne Henley was born May 9th, 1956, the oldest of four sons. Raised by an alcoholic father who got physical with both his wife and kids when he drank, uh, and a protective, but, you know, not protective enough to leave the man who beat her kids devoutly religious mother. Uh, In 1970, Henley started taking odd jobs to help his mom cover household expenses not being paid for by his deadbeat drunk of a dad. By 1971, he dropped out of school at the age of 15. Before dropping out, he met David Brooks, and the two became friends hanging out together, skipping school. Uh, Around the same time, Henley began to realize that many of the boys from his neighborhood, eight boys, between the ages of 13 and 17, had recently just disappeared. He'd actually joined a search party to help find two of them in May of 1971. Excuse me. By the time he learned exactly what had happened to his friends, he would later say that he felt like he was in too deep, that he was too concerned over his own life and the lives of his younger brothers to do anything but go along with the Candyman's continued hunting. Feels like a bit of a rationalization, but but who knows how I, I would have felt if I was walking in his shoes, you know, shoes that were walking through some very dark places. Uh, before we move on, let's jump back a little ways now to the, to the first known victim of the Candyman. On September 25th, 1970, 18-year-old college freshman Jeffrey Conan is hitchhiking from the University of Texas to his parents' home in Houston, along with another student back when people did shit like that. So he's heading from Austin to Houston uh, when hitchhiking wasn't an obvious what the fuck are you thinking, big no-no? Uh, Conan was, was picked up, of course, by none other than Dean Candyman Coral, offered to give him a ride the rest of the way to his parents' house, but instead took him into his worst nightmare. Conan would later be found buried on High Island Beach on August 10th, 1973. He had died of asphyxiation from manual strangulation. He was naked, bound at the hands and feet, wrapped in plastic. He'd been buried beneath a layer of lime under a large boulder. Supposedly, it was around this time that Conan, uh, around the time that Conan was kidnapped, the David Brooks walked in on those two boys uh, being tied to the torture board we talked about earlier. However, if that's true, what happened to the second boy tied to the board? He's never mentioned as one of the Candyman's victims. I, I highly doubt he would just let go. And, and while David would later lead police to the body of Conan, he didn't lead police to the body of the second victim on the torture board. So, so based on the amount of date discrepancies that occur on Wikipedia and, and other references to this particular killer, I think David actually walked in on, on the Candyman's second and third known victims. Jimmy Glass and Danny Yates. Uh, it, se- it seems to me like that he, that he had killed before he recruited David to help him, before David knew. On December 13th, 1970, best friends Jimmy Glass and Danny Yates were attending a youth rally and worship service at the Evangelist, Evangelist, uh, Evangelistic, there we go, Evangelistic Temple in Houston Heights. Man. Uh, they were both 14 years old. A friend would later say, during the middle of the service, I saw them walk up an aisle 
as if they were going to the restroom, and that was it. They basically vanished into thin air. Both boys weren't considered at risk for being runaways. Family life pretty stable in both homes, well-adjusted, well-liked. One source says they were considered, quote, handsome and hip. Glass wore beaded leather necklaces and had a leather jacket with fringe sleeves. Uh, so, you know, fucking cool kids wearing cool fringe sleeves. Uh, seriously, though, good reminder that this kind of thing can happen to anybody. All the more reason to keep a close eye on your kids. Man, the further I get into this suck, the more I want to never let my kids leave the house, which is also not safe, you know, or, or reasonable. But, man, why do these monsters have to exist? Like, like, why if you're found guilty of being a child murderer or sexual sadist that attacks children, why can't we just kill you? Like, why risk these monsters ever hurting another child? You don't deserve to be rehabilitated. Why does it feel like good people kill themselves all the time, but these monsters almost never do? Why can't I read more of those stories where somebody, you know, is thinking about doing something like this and then just, I don't know, throws themselves off a cliff before they can hurt somebody? Is, is it okay to advocate selective suicide? Like, like if you've molested and murdered a child and have the urge to do so again, is, is it okay to want that person to kill themselves before they act on their evil urge? I think so. A missing persons report filed for both kids. Unfortunately, the paperwork found its way to the desk of two different cops, and then neither cop connected the two cases. Now, sadly, this is very indicative of how future disappearances are going to be handled. Uh, odds are you're going to become infuriated with the, uh, the police in Houston uh, working in 1970 to 1973 here very soon. Both boys murdered the same day by Coral after spending time on his torture board. And the Candyman didn't just kill those two boys that day. He destroyed their families. Their families combed the streets of Houston looking for their sons for the next couple of years. Danny Yates' father once even drove to Monterey, Mexico, 500 miles away, after someone reported seeing his son there. Uh, Danny's older sister, Cindy, uh, would later tell the Texas Monthly in an interview, Dad began to fall apart right in front of our eyes. He was so worried that Danny had left because he had been too hard on him. Meanwhile, Jimmy's mother, Ima Glass, literally lost her mind over her son Jimmy's disappearance. Jimmy's brother, Willie, would later report many, many times she'd see a teenager hitchhiking on another side of the freeway and she'd shout, that's Jimmy, we have to turn around. And to keep the peace, my dad would turn around every time. Then one day she got a gun, grabbed my younger sister, Pamela, and dragged her to a back bedroom. When the SWAT team arrived, she fired a shot into the floor and yelled, they're not going to steal Pamela from me like they did my Jimmy. We got the pistol away from her, took her to Harris County Psychiatric Unit. She was never the same and neither were the rest of us. Dean Coral didn't just kill, you know, he, and at this point they knew of 27, 27 boys. He killed 27 families. Now, how heavy is that? These pieces of shit like the Candyman, they don't just murder their victims. They, they psychologically murder their victims' families. God, man, need a break for the, from the heaviness? Yeah, me too. Uh, let, let's talk about something positive and uplifting. Can we do that? Can we agree to do that? Let's, let's talk about today's socially conscious, not dark, and bloodthirsty sponsor. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Jake West Clock Candy. Watches made out of pralines, grandfather clocks made out of snickerdoodles, snickerdoodles made, snickerdoodles made out of grandfathers. What? No. Uh, today's Time Suck is brought to you by Lisa. Get some quality sleep, Time Suckers. I finally have time for it, and, and it is the damn best. A quality night's sleep helps you recover from distractions faster, prevent burnout, make better decisions, improve your memory, overall make fewer mistakes. Not marketing, it's science. Uh, to design a better mattress, Lisa leveraged 30 plus years of experience, hundreds of hours of testing to develop the perfect mattress for all body shapes and sleeping styles. For me, my Lisa provides that perfect blend of memory foam-like body customization without the memory foam-like heat-retaining sweat factory creation. I love it. I love, uh, you know, I'm warm, but not a pile of sweat. Uh, Lindsay loves it. Uh, unfortunately, both of our bed hog uh, dickhead doodles love it. Penny P and Ginger B are the fur queens of the Lisa mattress. Uh, don't miss some summer savings on a Lisa mattress right now. Uh, go Get $160 off a Lisa mattress at lisa.com slash timesuck. That's lisa.com slash timesuck, L-E-E-S-A, for $160 off. Lisa, truly a better place to sleep. Link in the episode description right there. Just a little button waiting to be pushed. So go ahead and push it. Okay. And now back to, uh, yeah, utter hopeless darkness. January 30th, 1971, the next Candyman victims, Donald Waldrop, 15, his younger brother, Jerry, 13, disappear on the way to a local bowling alley. Brothers. Ugh. On their way, they encounter Dean Coral, David Brooks, and instead of bowling a few games, found themselves enticed into Coral's white uh, Econoline van. And, and then they both end up on the torture board. Oh, my God. And then the absolute worst 
happens to them. As part of their torture, uh, these two brothers are told that, uh, that the one sibling who manages to beat the other to death, each of them handcuffed, you know, with one hand to the board, will be freed. And then the two spent the day struggling to beat their other brother, using their one free hand to try to beat the other brother to death until they were almost both dead. And then neither survived that terrible day. When Coral and Brooks returned, the Waldorf brothers were both strangled. They were buried in a boat shed Dean had rented. Uh, may have a new winner in the, uh, the, the, the contest of the ongoing or, or the ongoing contest of the person I hate the most. I, I may hate the candy man now more than I hate the toy box killer. I didn't think it was possible after the toy box episode, but, but this guy definitely on par with that sadistic fuck. Like, I wish I could go back in time, tie those two assholes to a board, let them try to beat each other to death. You know, maybe put them on a spit, stick them in a big oven, slowly cook them. Maybe make, you know, maybe cook one, then make the other eat them. I don't know. Whatever is the worst thing to do, that's what I want to do to both of them. It's hard for my mind to actually accept what I just told you. Hard to process this shit actually happened. Some kind of mental defense mechanism I feel like stops us sometimes from really believing the, the, or understanding the true horribleness, like the depths of it, you know, like like the uh, of these two young men being put in that situation, trying to kill the person they love in order to live, in order for this monster to free them. <sighs> Why was Dean doing this? There's not a lot of info out there about his childhood, you know, nothing in depth. You know, in the info, you do find nothing bad comes up other than, you know, whatever, a divorce, a homophobic mom, no mention of actual abuse, no mention of early indicators of sociopathic or psychopathic behavior. How is he able to so quickly dehumanize people to that extent? What, what allows someone to do that something, you know, that, that abhorrent? I guess, you know, I guess it is just, you know, if you're a true sociopath, true psychopath, you really don't care what happens to other people. Man, some people so damaged, they just need to be put down like rabid dogs before they, before they bite someone else. Uh, the wall drops home only half a mile from a church where Jimmy and, and Danny disappeared. The police still did not investigate. The Waldorf's brother, uh, uh, or excuse me, the Waldorf brother's father, Everett, a burly divorced construction worker, later told the Houston Chronicle that he filled out a missing persons report at the police department, then camped on the police department door for eight months. I was there about as much as the chief was, he said, but all they would say was, why are you here? You know your boys are runaways. How much rage did Everett feel when he found out the truth? I mean, it's not like the police could have saved his boys when he did find out the truth, but still... That poor bastard lost two, two sons to the Candyman. Bet he wishes that old Candyman movie legend was true, that he could just say his name five times in the mirror, bring him into existence so he could just get his hands around that demon and re-kill it himself, you know? March 9th, 1971, Coral and Brooks run into 15-year-old Randall, or, yeah, Randall Harvey, just ridden his bike to work, was heading home after finishing his shift at a local gas station. When he hadn't returned home two days later, his mom filled out a missing persons report, later called police to let them know David Brooks had a history with her son Harvey. That, that David had threatened to kill the missing boy over a stolen stereo. And as with other appearances, the police do not follow the leads. They declare him a runaway. Uh, his body, with a gunshot wound to the head, turned up years later in a boat storage shed where Coral buried the majority of his victims. As longtime listeners know, I'm very pro-law enforcement. But I gotta say, does not sound like the Houston Heights area officers in 71 were the, uh, the finest squad to ever wear a badge. Like, were they just understaffed? Did they lack proper leadership? Do they lack the right detective to string these disappearances together, you know? Is it because in the pre-computer age, it was just hard to connect dots in situations like this? Like, like how many boys of roughly the same age have to go missing from the same part of town in the same time frame before you start to think, hey, maybe these kids aren't running away. Maybe they're being taken. Maybe we should put our heads together and see if, I don't know, some patterns emerge. I guess it's easy for me to play armchair detective, but Jesus. May 19th, 1971, David Hillegist, only 13, his friend Gregory Malley Winkle, only 16, when they disappeared, his actual last name was Winkle, I, I've used that as a joke last name, I didn't know anybody had that name, uh, when they disappeared, well, on the way to a neighborhood swimming pool, the parents immediately go to police, yet again, police do not investigate, uh, lady, we just don't have time to chase every runaway, Winkle said an officer told her when she reported her son missing, uh, the Hillegist then borrowed money from a neighborhood credit union to hire a private investigator who turned up a new theory he thought their boys might have been abducted by a local man known for providing male prostitutes for gay clients. A man known as Chicken <laughs> as Chicken Joe. I swear to God. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Did, did you just say a man named Chicken Joe? Uh-huh. Uh, did not expect someone named uh, Chicken Joe to make a cameo in this or any other tale. <laughs> 1971. Texas gay pimp named Chicken Joe. I don't, I don't know that I've ever wanted to see a photo of someone we've talked about more badly than I do right now. 
Like, <laughs> like there's no way old Chicken Joe was just wearing, you know, jeans, sneakers, you know, just a normal T-shirt. Nah, man, you don't, you don't wear that if you're Chicken Joe. Uh, I Googled various versions of Chicken Joe, like Houston Chicken Joe, Houston Chicken Joe Gay Pimp. Uh, nothing came up. Well, well, stuff came up. Uh, oh, boy, did stuff come up. But no pictures of this dude came up. I, I pictured Chicken Joe wearing, like, snakeskin boots, super, super tight bell bottoms, maybe some leather pants, uh, maybe a vest with no shirt underneath, uh, like an American Indian dream catcher at the end of a long gold chain for a necklace, a lot of leathery beaded bracelets, De- definitely a pimp cane, an, an eccentric custom cane, not one you can just buy, some kind of some kind of sculpted metal carved wood chicken head for a handle. Uh, chicken Joe wears a cowboy hat with several chicken feathers tucked into a tie-dyed bandana wrapped around the, the brim of his, ca- of his hat, you know. The hat, and, the hat and cane combo would be his signature look, how clients would recognize him. You know, like, like Chicken Joe, he might not wear the vest every day. Sometimes, you know, sometimes he wears a tight tank top. Sometimes a, a loose mesh crop top. Sometimes no shirt and tassels on his nipples, which are for sure both as pierced as the head of his dick. He has definitely Prince Albert in it. Uh, he may even walk uh, like a surprisingly like chill chicken, <laughs> like around on a leash, right? Like a little leather, like metal beaded leash. The little chicken has like a spiked collar. And, and, and a chicken that's just fucking chill, so chill, heals better than the finest show dog. How do I, fi- how do I find Chicken Joe? Uh, just look for the man with the pimp limp and chicken feathered cowboy hat walking the coolest motherfucking chicken you ever did see. That's when you know you found Chicken Joe. What's up, Chicken Joe? Ba ba, playboy, ba ba. That's Chicken Joe speak for same old, same old. You know, can't complain. How how you living, Chicken Joe? Ba ba. I'm chicken going pack, playboy. I'm chicken going pack. Ba ba. That's Chicken Joe speak for. I'm doing fine. Thank you very much for asking. Ba ba. Might find hair rug, playboy. I rub my fingers too smooth. Ba ba. That's actually Chicken Joe speak for. <laughs> Let's take a second and hear from today's last sponsor. Mm-hmm. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Chicken Joe's Custom Cowboy Hat Bandanas. Snake skin bandanas, lizard skin bandanas, chicken skin bandanas. Order five or more $100 Playboy bok bok bandanas and get a free hand-carved chicken cane. No. Time Suck is brought to you by Hims. Do any of you fellow male suckers or do any of the men of some of my lady suckers who are into or no dudes suffer from dry skin, thinning hair, you don't want to be thinning, or a soft shamecock that you want to transform into a rock-hard booty knocking cock. Too many dudes don't think it's cool to take care of themselves. I was one until recently. You know, now I'm hitting smoothies again, a- acai bowls on the road, putting eye cream on my face. I have to wash my face with special face soap. I have hand creams, beard lotions, conditioner, leave-in conditioner, face and body lotion. Why? Because it makes me feel good and life's too short not to feel good about yourself. 4 specializes in shit that makes dudes feel good about being dudes. Will finasteride for sure thicken your hair? No. But it for sure has helped thicken mine and other dudes' hair that I know. Will, will special anti-aging Hims lotion make you look five years younger? No. But when I put it on, it makes me think I look five years younger. It makes Lindsay think I look five years younger. I, 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 I feel like that I look younger when I use it. For Hims.com is a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, sexual wellness for men. You know, Hims connects you with real doctors, medical grade solutions to treat hair loss and so much more. And Time Suckers get a trial month of Hims for just $5 today. Right now, while supplies last, see website for full details. This will cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or pharmacy. Go to forhims.com slash timesuck. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash timesuck. Forhims.com slash timesuck. Link in the episode description. Treat yourself, suckers. And now again, back to the darkness of the Hillages looking for their son, David, his friend Gregory, looking, looking uh, into Chicken Joe. Leading, leading to nowhere, of course. Uh, however, uh, Mrs. Hill just uh, almost helps police solve the case. She learns that Gregory had a friend who drove a Plymouth GTX, and, and she said she'd seen one in the neighborhood, license plate, TMF724. If police had bothered to look into that, they would have learned that that GTX was registered to who? Dean Candyman Coral. Now, to be fair to the police, though, by this time, sh- she had burned out the officers with constant phone calls, suggesting numerous witnesses offering all kinds of tips Sadly, by the time she provided them with this information, they had started to tune her out. August 17th, 1971. 17-year-old Reuben Watson Haney headed to the movies when he encountered the barbaric trio. He told his mother he would see her when she got home from work, headed off to the sci-fi flick The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston, last movie he'd ever see. He later called and said he was spending the night with David Brooks. His overnight plans with Brooks were a big clue that sadly in hindsight, missed again, uh, another victim of the Candyman classified as a runaway. 
February 9th, 1972, the son of a Houston police officer, Willard Rusty Branch Jr. goes missing. And then Branch's Houston uh, uh, police officer father would literally die of a heart attack in the midst of searching for his son, effectively ending any further efforts to find him, another collateral victim of the Candyman. The following month, March 24th, 1972, Frank uh, Aguirre uh, calls the home of his girlfriend, Rhonda Williams, says he'd be home, uh, says uh, he'd be coming over after his shift at, at Long John Silver's. Long John Silver's, man. I always forget about that place. It, it still exists. One of the last, one of the, like the few fast food places, like the long time, you know, or, or that have been around for a long time that I've never eaten at or had interest in eating at. Uh, sorry if you're a big Long John Silver's fan. Y- you'll never be a sponsor. Fast food and fish seem like a dangerous combination to me. I feel like you're, you're risking a screaming match between your butt and the toilet over some food that's not worth that. Like if you're going to jack your colon up, do it at Taco Bell. Get some of that Mexican pizza. Oh, it's delicious. It violently, it violently assaults my insides every time I eat it, but it's so cheap and it tastes so, so good. Uh, as Frank was leaving Long John Silver's, he ran into Dean Coral, David Brooks, Wayne Henley, right, this devil's trio at this point. He was an acquaintance uh, of Henley's. Henley called him over to Coral's van, invites him to the Candyman's apartment to have a few beers, smoke a little weed. Henley would later tell detectives he helped pull the handcuff trick on Frank and then off to the torture board and to his death he'd go. On April 20, 1972, 17-year-old Candyman victim Mark Scott left home for a weekend trip to Mexico, never came back. Uh, Mark had been recently arrested for carrying a prohibited knife, so police decided that he must have been a runaway. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, attempted to escape his problems. They never investigated his appearance. Man, I, I just feel like they just throw that in anything. Like, just, hey, hey man, uh, I just saw somebody. I just witnessed somebody get grabbed by a dude in a hood who said, who screamed, I'm kidnapping you right now, and threw him into a van. Uh, can you please look into it? Ah, sounds like he ran away to me. Sounds like, sounds like a classic runaway. Oh, the old classic runaway trick of pretending to be obviously kidnapped. No, we're not going to do any paperwork. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I have another break to take. Um, okay. Billy Jean Balch Jr.'s parents were still recovering from the death of their son, Marvin, who was killed in a car accident in 1969 when they got a suspicious letter in 1972 from their other son, Billy, saying he'd gotten a job in Austin and would be later home that summer. Uh, be home later that summer. Said he'd gone off with his friend, Johnny Del Home. Says, uh, dear mom and dad, I'm sorry to do this, but Johnny and I found a better job working for a trucker loading and unloading from Houston to Washington. We'll be back in three or four weeks. After a week, I'll send money to help you and mom out. Love, Billy. Billy's father was a long-haul trucker, knew that this was bullshit. So he goes to the police. The police, as in all the other cases, not helpful. Uh, just again, fucking runaway. Just, just, no matter what, they just classify it as runaway. And so, you know, he dies on May 21st, 1972. Uh, sometime in June of 72, the exact date does not seem to be known. The trio heads uh, are led, headed by the Candyman, lures 19-year-old Billy Riddinger over into the Candyman's house, ties him to a plywood torture board, viciously sodomizes and abuses him, uh, or Coral does. And then for some reason, uh, he's let go. Brooks was able to persuade Dean to allow Riddinger to be released. Uh, and, and I guess possibly due to the shame of what he'd been subjected to, he, he never would report anything to the police. Very unfortunate because 14 more boys would then die after this by Dean Corll's hand, at least. July 19th, 1972, Stephen Sickman, 17, when he disappears after leaving a party, family reports him missing. Yet again, classified as a runaway. <sighs> I couldn't find any info on how many kids were running away in Houston in 1972, but was it just a fucking epidemic? Like, were, were kids just leaving home in mass in the early 70s in Houston? Was it so common that the police just could not possibly keep up with it? What was going on there? August 21st, 1972. Roy Bunton, a boy with sparkling eyes and a bright dimpled smile, leaves home for a job as an assistant at a Houston shoe store located in Northwest Mall. Traveling on foot, he doesn't make it to work, and he never makes it home. August 3rd, 1972. Wally. J. Wally. Why would I read Wally as Wally? What is wrong with Hey, hey, Wally. Hey, dude, I've told you many times my name is Wally. Ah, okay, Wally. Wally, I don't know how to talk. October 3rd, 1972. <laughs> Wally, for sure Wally. J. Simono. I'd love if somebody wrote in. Actually, I have no idea it is pronounced Wally. He's the one Wally pronounced Wally. Uh, was headed over to spend the night with his friend. I guess, uh, yeah, why am I making that joke? Is uh, I'm not thinking. No one would know him now. Because sadly, he's no longer with us. He was headed to spend the night with his friend, Richard Hembry, uh, August 3rd, 1972. The two were later seen in a white van by a friend who tried to talk to them, but was shooed away by another boy. That night, Simono, 14, calls his mom and shouts, Mama, into the phone before the connection's broken. She says, Darling, where are you? Darling, here's some shuffling, some scuffling. Here's a click. The phone goes dead. Awful. 
incredibly again labeled a fucking runaway. Dude. Ah. I want to just go back there and just scream at these guys. Get fucking, get off your asses. Look into this. I got to say, again, it's armchair detective, but they seem like the laziest pieces of shit ever. Uh, November 12th, 1972, Richard Allen Kepner leaves home, heads out to a payphone to call his fiance, and, and then no one ever sees him again. His remains would not be identified until September 1983. February of 73, 17-year-old Joseph Lyles, quiet, artistic young man, disappears, likely headed to a West Houston skating rink where he liked to spend time. He was an acquaintance of the Candyman, who would also be labeled, guess what? Yeah, a runaway. William Ray Lawrence, 15, calls his father the night of June 4th, 1973, tells him he's going fishing with some friends, would be home in a few days. He is kept alive by the Candyman for four days of torture before finally being killed and buried at the boathouse. Just two weeks later, June 15th, 1973, 20-year-old Raymond Blackburn abducted, strangled, buried at Lake Sam Rayburn uh, Reservoir. Uh, Blackburn, a, a married man from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was hitching a ride from, from the Heights back to Baton Rouge to see his newborn baby. When the candy man got him. What a nightmarish change of plans. Going to celebrate new life. Going to witness the start of something special. And then just see your own life. And so tragically and horribly. Ugh. Evening of July 7th, 1973. Less than a month after Raymond's disappearance. 15-year-old Homer Garcia calls his mom. Says he's spending the night with some friends. Instead, he would end up shot and left to bleed to death in the bathtub of 2020 Lamar Drive. One of the uh, many residences uh, of the candy man after a night of sadistic torture. Random change in MO, I guess Dean must have just wanted to experiment with something new or, or something went awry. Uh, John Manning Sellers disappears less than a week later. On July 12th, 1973, just two days before his 18th birthday, he's found a month later, shot to death and buried. Week later, July 19th, 1973, 16-year-old Michael Anthony Balch left his home with money for a haircut and a pack of cigarettes, heads out the door, never seen again, labeled a runaway. Again, just a week later, July 25th, 1973, 17-year-old Charles Cobble, 18-year-old Marty Ray Jones spotted walking from their apartment building in the company of another boy, according to one of the boy's neighbors. That boy, most likely either David Jones or Wayne Henley, would lead these boys to the Candyman. Marty Ray Jones would die slowly after being forced to watch his best friend be tortured, sexually assaulted, and shot to death while waiting for his turn. My God, the Candyman escalating the frequency of his attacks like these sadists so often do is a killing frenzy. They're never satisfied, man. Their sick desires seem to just fulfill them less and less. They attack more and more often. Their sick obsession deepens. Maybe Dean just started to feel as many of these assholes do. He was above capture. Didn't have to plan as hard or be as careful. He just gotten away with it so many times. Just figured he'd just keep on getting away with it. 13-year-old James Stanton Dremala, small frame blonde boy abducted by Brooks and Coral, riding his bike in Pasadena, Texas, August 3rd, 1973. He would become Coral's last victim. Uh, the teenager who planned to take his girlfriend to see Live and Let Die, the latest James Bond flick, had been collecting bottles to pay for the date coming up that Sunday. Wanted to ride down to a convenience store to collect the deposit. God damn it, man. That sounds so sweet. Like such a good kid. He's collecting bottles to pay for a cute little date. So happy to do it. Daydreaming about playing kissy face with his little girlfriend. You know, so happy she said yes. Felt like a million bucks. Then he runs into the Candyman's minions who talk him into or possibly just drag him into a, a madman's van. Ugh, meets a tragic end. James's mother had asked him not to go out that night saying, I don't, want to, I don't want you riding your bike after dark. But he talked her into it. Ah, oh, mom, I'll be back in just a few minutes. I'm not going to be out there very long. Well, it turns out he'd be gone forever. How that must have haunted her and possibly haunts her still. August 7th, 1973, night that starts out like nearly all of the other Candyman murders. Candyman henchman, Elmer Wayne Hanley, Henley, just 17 years old himself, has invited a friend, 19-year-old Timothy Cordell Curley, over to Dean Candyman Coral's house. Curley has agreed to come over. They first drove back to Henley's house where they ran into Henley's friend, 15-year-old Rhonda Williams. Henley invited her to Coral's place and the three pile into Curley's car, head to Pasadena where Dean was currently living. They get there about 3 a.m. early in the morning, August 8th. Uh, and when they get there, they find, you know, Cor Coral, the Candyman, to be furious. He's enraged that Henley has brought a girl over. He has introduced a girl into the mix. Like, dude, for a fucking number one rule of a sadistic sausage party, only bring sausage. Well, Coral eventually calms down. They all drink, smoke the devil's lettuce uh, until Wayne's friend Rhonda Williams passes out. Sometime later in the early morning hours of August 8th, Rhonda opens her eyes to see that both Wayne Henley and Tim Curley are handcuffed, duct tape over their mouths, feet bound together. Dean is holding a gun and threatening to kill them all. 
How scared is Wayne at this point? Tim doesn't know what he's truly gotten himself into, but Wayne knows all too well what could very well happen to him in a few minutes. Dean Candyman takes off his clothes, orders Henley to cut off Rhonda's clothes, announces that he's going to rape and torture Tim, and he wants Wayne to also rape and torture Rhonda. And then he really messes up by, by setting down his gun and untying Henley, who pretends to agree to his plan, and then Henley, once untied, grabs the gun, points it at him, And we'll never really know why he did what he did next. Maybe he knew that Coral was getting rid of him, was getting tired of him. He's going to soon kill him. Maybe he finally just wasn't willing to watch more of his friends and neighborhood kids die. Whatever the reason, he says to the Candyman, I can't go on any longer. I can't have you kill all my friends. Coral approaches Henley saying, kill me, Wayne. Like screaming, kill me, Wayne. Henley steps back a few paces as Coral continues to advance upon him shouting, you won't do it. And then Rhonda would later say, Wayne just started shooting. Wayne Henley hit the Candyman in the forehead with his first shot. The bullet fails to fully penetrate Coral's skull, and Coral, like a fucking monster in a horror movie that just will not die, continues to lurch towards Wayne Henley. Wayne fires two more rounds, the first hitting Coral in the left shoulder, the second missing him. Coral spins around. He spun around, staggers out of the room, hitting the wall of the hallway. The monster still lives. And then who pops in the window to save the day? None other than Chicken Joe. Hot damn. Don't worry, boys. Chicken Joe's here. He pops in. Bah, bah. Shit done too far, playboy. Shit don't take him too far. Bah, bah. He beats the candy man to death with his chicken cane while his pet chicken pecks the killer's eyes out. As suddenly as he's arrived, Chicken Joe is then gone. Bounces out the window. Limps down the dark street towards a strange mist that has appeared out of nowhere, making it to the candy man's house. He was personally taking the candy man's soul into the fog that would serve as a portal to hell itself so he could deliver Coral's soul to the devil before heading home for a biscuit or for a breakfast of honey biscuits, sausage gravy, sweet tea, that he'd eat off his own naked chest while laying in a crocodile skin hammock, being silently fanned by two nude male models in gimp masks covered in chicken feathers. Ba-ba! Pour some of that gravy on a biscuit. Ba-ba! Of course that's not what happened next. No, Henley fires three additional bullets into Dean, who's just staggered into the wall, Hits him in his lower back and shoulder. Dean slides down the wall in the hallway outside the room where the other two teenagers are bound. And then the candy man dies where he fell, his naked body lying with his face towards the wall. Rhonda would later say regarding her friend Elmer Wayne Henley, saving them all that night, whatever evil was in Wayne, there was still some good in him. And finally, the good one. Wayne saved my life and he saved Tim's life too. Wayne killed the devil. He kept his promise that night. He got me out of there. And then Henley called the police saying, I just shot a man and I want you. I want you. He trailed off. The 911 operator asked who he's speaking to, spelled out Henley's last name, asked for the address, repeats it back a few times. Henley struggles to find his composure and then patrol cars are dispatched. When the police arrive, Henley tells the officers about the candy man. And at first, the police don't believe him. The story seemed too crazy. He, you know, uh, Officer Mulliken, uh, one of the arriving officers, would later say, he started telling me that Coral had a warehouse, a warehouse full of bodies. Uh, I was pretty skeptical at the time. And then the police decided to not investigate any uh, anything. They just decided to drop the whole thing. They're just like, okay, well, whatever. Sounds like they ran away to me, and they just let everybody go. Uh, no, Henley named names Charles Cobble, Marty Jones, David Hill, uh, Hillgist. Hillgist. Uh, when Officer Mulliken checks out, he learns that each boy had a file with the Houston Missing Persons Division, all labeled runaways, of course. And then he learns that Dean Coral had a boat shed, a metal storage unit at Southeast Boat Storage Number 11 that he's rented for about two years. And then he changes his mind about the authenticity of Wayne's story. Uh, please, they, they go to the boat shed. They force open the doors to this windowless storage unit. It's about 12 feet wide, about 34 uh, feet deep. It contains the rusty body of a car, and it contains uh, a, a lot of decomposing bodies of all these missing kids. By the time it's over, 17 bodies will be found in the floor of the boat shed, various stages of decomposition. Some some people think there's still more bodies to be found that the police just didn't thoroughly uh, uh, you know, dig enough to, to find more missing kids. Four more bodies will be found at High Island Beach, Sandy Beach along the Gulf of Mexico, about 80 miles from Houston Heights. Uh, as of 2018, 29 Candyman victims have, have actually now been confirmed. And I kept saying 28. That's what all the literature said. But there was an, uh, another victim found. Investigators suspect uh, even more may uh, be found still. And now with Dean dead and his accomplices apprehended, uh, let's hop out of this time-stuck timeline, talk about the aftermath of the Candyman killings and what happens to his two accomplices. Elmer Wayne Henley Jr. and David Owen Brooks. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. All 
All right, the, the info we have regarding the crimes of the Candyman is, is unique. Unlike the Zodiac Killer, Jack the Ripper, uh, we, now, we now do know for sure who he was. We know for sure based on forensic evidence, testimony, what he did. But also we don't get to hear his side of the story because, you know, obviously he was killed before being arrested. There, there are no potentially satisfying post-arrest interviews uh, to lean on for info like there was with, you know, Bundy or Gacy or Dahmer. Uh, however, unlike a dude such as H.H. H. Holmes, uh, who was killed very quickly after being arrested, never confessed to most of his crimes, and then took most of his secrets to the grave since no accomplices that, you know, that he had either, either lived or were able to be found to share exactly what he did, the police did apprehend the two people who were along for almost the full ride of his crimes and, and witnessed and, you know, even sometimes took an active part in, in the Candyman's crimes. Both still alive today. We do have their testimony. So, so let's go over that testimony now. David Brooks gave two written confessions to the police after Wayne killed the Candyman. This, this is the first one. I came to the police station on August 9th in order to make a witness statement about what I know about Dean Coral. I came down on my own free will, and I gave that statement to Detective Tucker. In that statement, what I said was partially the truth, but I left out the fact that I was present when most of the killings happened. I was in the room when they happened and was supposed to help if something went wrong. Man, my God. This dude, this kid, kid at the time, not only in the room when the crimes happened, he, he's supposed to help out when things go wrong. Can you imagine watching all those other kids be raped, tortured, murdered? Some kids he, he knew from school, knew from his childhood, some were his friends. The first killing that I remember happened when Dean was living in Yorktown townhouses. There were two boys there, and I left before they were killed, but Dean told me that he had killed them afterwards. I don't know where they were buried or what their names were. The first few that Dean killed were supposed to have been sent out somewhere in California. The first killing that I remember being present at was on oh, and that California thing. Just hold, remember that. Put a little pin in that. And to come up with a little interesting footnote to all this, to this story. The first killing that I remember being present at was on 6363 San Felipe. That boy was Reuben Haney. Dean and I were the only people involved in that one, but Dean did the killing, and I was just present when it happened. I also remember two boys who were killed at the Place One Apartments on Magnum. They were brothers, and their father worked next door where they were building some more apartments. Oh, my God. Dad working next door. I was present when Dean killed them by strangling them, but again, I didn't participate. I believe I was present when they were buried, but I don't remember where they were buried. The youngest of these two boys is the youngest that was ever killed, I think. A boy by the name of Glass was killed at the Columbia address. I had taken him home one time, but he wouldn't get out because he wanted to go back to Dean's. I took him back, and Dean ended up killing him. Ugh. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure whether it was Glass that I took home or another boy, but I believe it was Glass. It was during that time that we were living on Columbia that Wayne Henley got involved. Wayne took part in getting the boys at first, and then later he took an active part in the killings. Most of the killings that occurred after Wayne came into the picture involved all three of us. Now, this is an interesting note. This note that Wayne took an active part in the killings. Like, is he just saying that? Is he trying to shift blame away from himself? Uh, did Wayne actually enjoy his time with the Candyman? You know, only killing when he assumed probably correctly based on being tied up that the Candyman was about to kill him. Uh, there was another boy killed at the Schuler house. Actually, there were two at this time. A boy named Billy Balch and one named Johnny. And I think his last name was Malone. It was actually Delome. Uh, Wayne strangled Billy and he said, hey, Johnny. And when Johnny looked up, Wayne shot him in the forehead with a 25 automatic. The bullet came out of his ear and he raised up. And about three minutes later, he said, Wayne, please don't. Then Wayne strangled him and Dean helped. Jeez. Uh, definitely uh, starting to sound like Wayne was not reluctantly involved. Dean moved to the Francesca apartments on Wirt. At that time, I was using Dean's car. So I was in and out all the time. After the Francesca apartments, Dean moved to Pasadena. I know of two that were killed there. One was from Baton Rouge. Yep, that dad. One was a small blonde boy from South Houston. I saw the boy from South Houston for about 45 minutes. I took him for pizza, and then I left, and he wanted me to come back. I wasn't there when either of these boys were killed. I did come in just after Dean had killed the boy from Baton Rouge. That was on a different day from the blonde boy. In all, I guess there were between 25 and 30 boys killed, and they were buried in three different places. I was present and helped bury many of them, but not all of them. Most of them were buried at the boat stall. There were three or four buried at Sam Rayburn, I think. I am sure there are two up there. One, the first one at Sam Rayburn, I helped bury them. And then the next one we took to Sam Rayburn, when he got there, Dean and Wayne found that the first one had come to the surface and either a foot or hand was above the ground. When they buried this one the second time, they put some type of sheetrock on top of him to keep him down. Uh, Sam Rayburn, by the way, uh, uh, yeah, big reservoir, about 150 miles northeast of Houston, named after a, a, a former, former Texas congressman, congressman, excuse me. The third place that they were buried was on the beach at High Island. This was right off the Winnie exit 
where the road goes to the beach. You turn east on the beach road and go till the pavement changes, which is about a quarter or a half mile, and the bodies are on the right side of the highway, about 15 to 20 yards off the road. Okay, and then he just goes on more about location. Now, this is David's second confession. Uh, where he says, my name is David Brooks, 18 years old, okay, da, da, da. and he actually mentions uh, his wife, Bridget. Uh, just the month before Wayne killed Dean in July uh, 73, Dane actually married his teen girlfriend, Bridget Jones, after she got pregnant. Years later, this, his daughter, uh, Rachel, uh, who didn't learn about her father's past until she was 17, would tragically die herself in a car accident the morning after her high school prom. Man, wear your seatbelts, time suckers. What a what an extra bit of tragedy in this story. Okay, then David continues with a statement that I've edited quite a bit because a lot of it is just repetitive of what he had said the first time. Uh, I remember one boy who was killed at Dean's house in Columbia. This was just before Wayne Henley came into the picture. Dean kept this boy around the house for about four days before he killed him. I don't remember his name, but we picked him up on 11th and Rutland. I think I helped bury this boy also, but I don't remember where it was. This was about two years ago. It really upset Dean to have to kill this boy because he really liked him. It really upset him? Well, it didn't upset him enough to let him go and face the fucking music for the, for the crimes he committed, did it? Uh, a boy by the name of Glass was also killed at the Columbia address. I had taken him home one time, but he wouldn't get out because he wanted to go back to Dean's. I took him back. Dean ended up killing, killing him. Oh, yeah, he, he had also said that. During this time that we were living on Columbia Street, that Wayne Henley got involved. da 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 uh, he talked about that. Wayne seemed to enjoy causing pain, and he was especially sadistic at the Shuler address. Most of the killings that occurred after Wayne came into the picture involved all three of us. Mm -hmm. I still did not take part in the actual killing, but nearly all three of us were there. Mark Scott was killed at the Shuler address. I had told yesterday my witness statement about Mark Scott being at the Shuler house, but I did not say I was present, which I was. Mark had a knife, and he tried to get Dean. He swung at him with the knife and caught Dean's shirt and barely broke the skin. He still had one hand tied. Dean grabbed the hand with the knife. Wayne ran out of the room and got a pistol, and Mark just gave up. Wayne killed Mark Scott, and I think he strangled him. Mark was either buried at the beach or at the boathouse. They got Billy Rittinger, and what I said in my witness statement was true about him. I took care of him while he was there, and I believe the only reason he's alive now is because I begged them not to kill him. Wayne and Dean got one boy by themselves while we were on Shuler. It was a tall, skinny guy. I just happened to walk in on the house, and there he was. I left before they killed this one. So if his statements are true, I got to say I do feel bad for David. Yes, yes, yes. He helped lure boys to their deaths, obviously. But he was just manipulated, molested, and groomed from such an early age for this role. I mean, brainwashed, really, truly, to become this horrible monster's assistant, uh, some, some sadist henchman. I, I just can't imagine the level of psychological power Dean must have held over him. Not excusing what he did, but it's just, you know, uh, his story is especially tragic to me. You know, the life he was lured into, uh, literally at first with free candy as a kid. Wayne Henley only gave one written confession. It'll be interesting to see how he portrayed his involvement compared to David's portrayal of him. He says, my name is Wayne Henley. I'm a white male, 17 years old. I live at 927 North 27th Street with my mother, grandmother, and brothers. About three years ago, I met a guy by the name of Dean Coral. Dean was a lot older than me, and a school friend of mine uh, named David Brooks introduced him uh, to me. David was always riding around in Dean's car and everything. I was only 14 back then, and I thought this was great. David Brooks told me he could get me in on a deal where I could make some money, and he took me to Dean Coral. Dean told me that he belonged to an organization out of Dallas that bought and sold boys, ran whores, and stuff like that. Dean told me that he would pay me $200 for every boy I could get him, and maybe more if they were real good-looking boys. I didn't try to find any for him until about a year later, and I decided that I could use the money to get better things for my people. So one day, I went over to Dean's apartment on Schuller Street— Told him I would find a boy for him. Dean had a GTX at the time, and we got in it. Dean and me started driving around. We picked up a boy at 11th and Studewood, and I talked to him since I had long hair and all, and it was easier for me to talk to him. I talked him into going to Dean's apartment to smoke some marijuana, so we went over to Dean's apartment. Dean left some handcuffs laying out where they could be seen, and we had this little deal set up where I would put the handcuffs on and then could get out of them. Then we talked this boy into trying to get out of them. The only thing was we put them on where the locks were turned in and where he couldn't get the key into them. Dean then took the boy down and tied his feet and put tape over his mouth. I thought Dean was going to sell him to the organization that he belonged to, so I left. Then the next day, Dean paid me $200. A day or so later, I found out that Dean had killed the boy. Then I found out that Dean had screwed him in the ass before killing him. This was the start of the whole thing, and since then, I have helped Dean get eight or ten boys. I don't exactly remember how many. Dean would screw all of them and sometimes suck them and make them suck him. Then he would kill them. I killed several of them myself with Dean's gun and helped him choke some others. Then we would take them and bury them in different places. David Brooks was with us most on most of them. Man, he, he, he's really not holding back. So far, what he's saying doesn't 
you know, or excuse me, does seem to really line up with what David said about it. N- no, uh, oh my God, I know I shouldn't have done what I did. Oh, may God have mercy on my soul kind of talk. Just very straightforward, cold, like, you know, I, I just needed some money. Uh, dude was paying $200 for what I thought was, you know, only human sex trafficking of minors. And I was fine with that. Then I found out it was murder and, uh, you know, I still wanted the money. So it was easier for me just to kind of help, you know, be along for it. And then I just you know, joined in the killing. Uh, then Wayne continues. I think the only three David Brooks wasn't with us on were the last ones at the house at Lamar Street in Pasadena. The ones that I can remember by name are David Hilgist, who Dean told me that he had killed and buried in his boat stall. A boy by the name of Mally Winkle, who David and Dean told me they had killed and put in the boat stall. Charles Cobble, who I killed and we buried in the boat stall. Then Marty Jones. Uh, me and Dean choked him and buried him in the boat stall. We killed a boy by the name of Billy Lawrence. I don't remember how we killed him, but we buried him up at Dean's place on Sam Rayburn Lake. Man, I don't remember how we killed him. How fucking dark has your life become when you don't remember important details of a murder you've helped commit? When it just blends in with all of the other murders. Uh, and then we killed him at the house on Lamar Street too. Dean told me about one named Reuben Haney, Haney that he killed and buried on beach at, on the beach at High Island. I shot and killed Don, Johnny Delone. Uh, we buried him on High Island. Then me and Dean and David Brooks killed two brothers, I think. We choked them. Buried Billy Balch at High Island. Mike Balch at Rayburn. Choked Mark Scott. Frank Aguirre uh, buried them at High Island. The last one I, I can remember uh, the name of is Homer Garcia. I shot him in the head. We buried him at Rayburn. I don't remember the dates on all of them because there's too many. Some of them were hitchhikers. I don't remember their names. Dean told me there was 24 in all, but I wasn't with him on all of them. I just, I tried to tell my mother two or three times about this stuff and she just wouldn't believe me. I even wrote a confession one time and hid it, hoping that Dean would kill me because the thing was bothering me so bad. I gave the confession to my mother and told her if I was gone for a certain length of time to turn it in, me and David talked about killing Dean so that we could get away from this whole thing and several times I have come to within an inch of killing him, but I just never got the nerve enough to do it until yesterday because Dean told me that this organization would get me if I ever did anything to him. This statement covers all that I can remember about all these killings and all that I know about where they are buried. Signed, Wayne Henley. Now, interesting notes about the organization. Might be some bullshit to shift blame and alleviate guilt, but I doubt it. Dean Corll certainly was a manipulative and ruthless piece of shit. Lying to these teens uh, about an organization that would kill them if they didn't cooperate doesn't seem like a stretch or out of character to me. And uh, and we're going to learn later uh, there, there might be something more to the organization. That's coming up uh, in a bit. Um now we have we have the confession, so let's jump to their trials. Not not long before detectives began digging up body after body, and you know, in the, in, in the heat, U.S. Supreme Court placed a moratorium on state executions. So so neither Henley nor Brooks was eligible for the uh, the, the the death penalty. Um, Henley was put in a solitary con- or put in solitary confinement while on trial. Uh, he was being taunted by other inmates. His bond set at hundred grand. Billy Rittinger, who had survived that final kidnapping, was released by Dean Corll to urgent David Brooks, arrived at the hearing with the paper bag over his head, holes cut out for his eyes so he could conceal his identity. The grand jury ended up handing down six indictments against Henley and four against David Brooks, and they decided to try both boys separately. Hen- Henley was up first. His trial was scheduled to start July 9, 1974, San Antonio's Bexford County Courthouse, almost 11 months after Henley, and, uh, Henley had killed Dean Corll. And what police had ruled as an act of self-defense, although he would not be held responsible for Coral's death, his confession led to him being named in the murders of Frank, Anthony Aguari, Homer Garcia, Charles Cobble, Marty Jones, William Lawrence, and Johnny DeLone. When the courtroom opened, famed author of In Cold Blood and journalist Truman Capote was there, hired by the Washington Post to write a, di- a daily diary of the proceedings, but Capote left uh, when Henley was brought into the courtroom and discontinued his work on the trial. Never said why. Maybe, uh, maybe nothing more to be said. Maybe just felt bad for Wayne. Henley's demeanor did not help him with the jury. During the trial, he was uh, at one point caught playing with one of the handcuffs from the torture board. During recesses, he wouldn't sit still, roam the courtroom, sometimes talking to news reporters like their old pals. He'd pick up packages of hair that had been submitted for evidence, including his own, examine them closely. The trial ended after only a week. Uh, and uh, after he had never took the stand uh, to testify in his own defense based on his defense counsel, and uh, the jury deliberated for just 90 minutes before finding him guilty. However, because the jury had not been sequestered properly during his first trial, some had received phone calls. Uh, he was granted a new trial, and that one only lasted 18 days. Uh, the jury there deliberated only two hours before returning with the same six 99-year guilty sentences he'd been given at his first trial. Hard not to agree with their decision, I guess. You know, unlike David, Henley was not groomed. He willingly involved himself with what he knew was at least human sex trafficking of minors. 
Like he knew that was at least what was going on when he joined. And then when he learned it was actually murder, you know, he seemed to pretty enthusiastically kind of go along with it. 1975, David Owen Brooks goes on trial for the murder of 15-year-old William Lawrence. His confession considered key evidence. His attorney, Jim Skelton, argues that his client had not committed any of the murders and attempted to portray Dean the Candyman Coral and, to a lesser degree, Henley as being the active participants. Assistant District Attorney Tommy Dunn dismissed the defense's contention outright at one point telling the jury, This defendant was in on this murderous rampage from the very beginning. He attempts to inform you he was a cheerleader if nothing else. That's what he is telling you about his presence. You know he was in on it. David Brooks' trial lasted less than a week. Jury deliberated for just 90 minutes before they reached their verdict, found him guilty of Lawrence's murder. On March 4th, 1975, sentenced him to life in prison. He showed no emotion. Uh, his wife, who was in the courtroom, burst into tears. Uh, and then as of, uh, as of 2015, he'd already been denied parole 19 times. I got to say, you guys know I'm pretty firm on crime and punishment, but, but I don't agree with the prosecutor's assessment or the jury's decision based on what I've read. He was only 12 when he met Dean, 12 when Dean started to groom him. Do you remember how impressionable you were when you were 12? How desperate you were for approval? Now imagine if no one in your life gave a shit about you. Kids are teasing you at school. Your parents are neglecting you. Some dude tells you you're the best, becomes a father figure, gives you candy, money, time, affection, then starts molesting you by the time you're 14, you know, by molested by your father figure. Then a year after that, he realized he's out molesting others, murdering others. Does that justify, you know, uh, finding other kids for Dean to murder? No, of course not. I don't know, but just life in prison? I, I just, I, I don't know. Part of me thinks that's too much for this, you know? Uh, it was never his idea to do any of that. And unlike Wayne, it, it doesn't feel like he, he was, you know, uh, enjoying being along for the ride. It feels like he was scared and manipulated into being on the ride. Even Wayne never said he actively participated in any of the killings. He, he clearly could have. I imagine Dean would have loved that, but he didn't. Doesn't seem fair he's still in prison with Wayne. And he may have been scared over his safety about some stuff Dean was saying that we are going to, again, I keep teasing it, but we're going to look at it in just a little bit uh, after we lighten things up and feel a little better about ourselves for a second by looking down on today's Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. All right. Under today's video, the Candyman, Dean Coral, Serial Killer Files, number 34, posted by user Rob Dyke. User Lakiva Brown posts something I thought was really cool. Lakiva wrote, This makes you realize the importance of teaching your son to watch out for creeps. Everyone always focuses on teaching girls about rape and whatever else, but what about the boys? Exactly. We shouldn't forget to remind our sons that there are predators on the prowl for them as well. You know, I've talked to both my kids probably too many times about this kind of shit, ever since they were little. They, they've known what's unacceptable for a grown person to do to them. And, and I've always, you know, or kid or whatever. And I've always told them they can always tell me what's going on and that I, that I guarantee I will make whatever's happening stop. I will find whoever's doing it. They'll, they'll either go to jail. <laughs> Maybe this is too much for me to tell my kids, but I've told them that the police don't, you know, believe our story, that I'll fucking kill them. And I'm not kidding. And my kids know that. They probably actually wish I would just shut up about it. Well, almost immediately under uh, Lakiva's kick-ass reminder, some stupid asshole redirects the comment section into a narrative that has nothing to do with the Candyman or her comment. They try to force the thread into talking about an issue that clearly is just a trigger for them, and, and, and they get shitty. So many people do this. At a show of mine in West Palm Beach, uh, just, you know, just recently, had an audience member yell after me making some comments uh, about some flat earther in the audience who couldn't handle my flat earth mockery and actually walked out. Uh, well, this, this audience member yells at me, well, at least he wasn't in favor of pedophiles, as if I was in favor of pedophiles. And I knew what he meant. I had done a setup to some jokes earlier where I said, uh, the joke goes something to the effect of ignorant people, or this is the setup, ignorant people are the worst people on earth. And you might think, what about murderers, rapists, pedophiles? Aren't they worse than dummies? Yeah, sure, individually, but they don't have the dummies' numbers. And that's the real danger with idiots. They're out there in the hundreds of millions. Odds are murder not going to affect your day in a negative way. Statistically, not going to have a bad experience with a murderer tomorrow. If you do, terrible day. Arguably your worst slash last day but probably not going to happen. But you're definitely going to have an unpleasant run-in with the dumb shit. Sadly, your ongoing daily so say, your ongoing daily social forecast is always 100% chance of some dumb. So I say something, basically that. And then I go into a bunch of jokes about how idiots, you know, add stress to our lives. And, and, and all this easily triggered dude heard was, he loves pedophiles. And I pointed out how wrong he was, you know, how I'd never said anything along the lines of, you know who's awesome? Pedophiles. How cool are child molesters? Uh, in fact, later in the same show, I did another new joke where I describe an island I'd like to send pedophiles to where they'll be killed and eaten by lions. But he doesn't, he doesn't hear that. He doesn't make it to the aggressively anti-pedophile joke. 
He's already stormed out. He's already yelled at the manager in the lobby. I heard about this after the show for allowing a pro-pedophile comedian to, to unleash his it's cool to diddle kids agenda on stage. Fucking seriously. On my flight home, I actually ran into a guy who was at the show, and he said that he and his friends had a real good laugh about that idiot later that night. This dude who, who, who honestly probably should save the money he's spending on comedy club tickets and spend it on therapy. He, he's clearly struggling with some shit. Only heard what he wanted to hear and then tried to force his, you know, pre-programmed agenda on everybody else. Like, like so many idiots of the internet do. Like user hit me up who under, under Lakiva's comment about how boys should be taught about creeps as well as girls. He sees another uh, poster, Ruby Rain, write, yes, I'm a feminist and I completely agree. Girls are always worn, but boys are not. A post agreeing with Lakiva. But all hit me up reads is the word feminist and off to the idiot races he goes. He posts, I'm not a feminist. We already have equality in first world countries. What? Now, now look, look, I do think it, I, I can see how people, I guess, may feel it's unnecessary for Ruby, Ruby Rain to qualify her post with I'm a feminist. You could argue, well, who gives a shit? Let your comment stand on its own. You know, the documentary you're commenting under has nothing to do with, you know, being or not being a feminist. But I can also see her adding the qualifier of feminist, uh, you know, to, as a nice way of saying, hey, even as someone who primarily focuses on equality for, for women, even as someone who focuses on not letting women be dominated by a deeply ingrained and longstanding cultural patriarchy, I can still see that these young men were done a tremendous cultural disservice by not being informed that they too as young men can become the victim of a sexual predator. I fucking get it. All right, I get it, Ruby Rain. Uh, hit me up, does not get it. The word feminism has just become an emotional trigger for him because of some kind of negative encounter or encounters he had with people who are or, or claim to be feminists or or maybe he's just a misogynistic asshole. Dude, no one gives a shit that you're not a feminist, hit me up. And actually, we don't have equality, you dumb shit, in the first world for men and women. Women are the victims of sexual assault far more often than men. They still get paid less than men for the same jobs in the workplace. Look at any magazine rack in the grocery store. It's clear our culture still values women primarily based on their physical appearance. And this is coming from a dude who hosted a show for two years on Playboy uh, showcasing nude models. I, I can both admire a woman's physical beauty. Uh, I'm a straight dude, uh, attracted to women, boobs. Yeah, I'm in. Vagina, check. Love it. But I can also respect the same woman as being an intellectual equal. Same chance as a random dude to me uh, uh, as being you know smart or smarter than me, or maybe not as smart as me, whatever, same. Unfortunately, a lot of people still don't see it that way. Not in 2018. They still don't. And study history. And if you don't see that women's rights have been consistently oppressed and ignored by almost every single culture throughout the history of humanity, well, then you're just not looking hard enough. Ruby Train comes back with another good point. Instead of uh, being mean, says, hit, uh, hit me up. Good for you. Uh, but most of the planet isn't the first world. Excellent point. Yes, YouTube isn't just the United States. Some people reading these comments do live in blatantly you know, like uh, uh, fundamental uh, I Islamic type countries that are blatantly sexist. Um, you know, hit me up, can't acknowledge this though. Instead of addressing what Ruby Train actually wrote, he goes back to forcing his agenda of hating feminists, writing, feminism is just about hating men. Now it's not, dummy. It's a silly blanket statement made by someone who doesn't like to think hard about things. Some feminists may, and I'm sure do hate men, but many don't. All don't. And then when no one replies immediately, hit me up, ask Ruby Train, why do you hate men? Once again, dummy, see, he's just, he's forcing this. No one is saying any of this. No one is prompting any of this. No one has talked about hating men. The rest of the thread continues to show great patience with Hit Me Up. Uh, user, uh, Lady Cochan posting, you're thinking of misandry, not feminism. People who claim to be feminists and yet say they hate men are not feminists. Feminism is all about equality. There is a great quote about feminism. The thing is, it's patriarchy that says men are stupid and monolithic and unchanging and incapable. It's patriarchy that says men have animalistic instincts and just can't stop themselves from harassing and assaulting. It's patriarchy that says men can only be attracted by certain qualities, can only have particular kinds of responses, can only experience the world in narrow ways. Feminism holds that men are capable of more, that they are more than that. Cool quote. I don't know who said it. They didn't put the author there. But, uh, but we're capable of more than just being fuck machines. Yeah, agreed. And, and what does Hit Me Up have to say to this? Nada, nothing. To his credit, based on nearly everyone else in the thread agreeing with Lady Kuchan, Ruby Train, Lakiva Brown, others, he probably realized he's a little out of his uh, out of his depth now. Uh, and then user World Star Hip Hop puts a nice little button on the thread, say, uh, posting Lakiva, stay woke. Did not expect that coming from World Star Hip Hop, uh, a website mostly dedicated to, from what I can tell, women fighting in public. But refreshing today, refreshing to see how many people really aren't idiots of the internet. You know, many people are staying woke. Idiots.
Okay, so back to the candy man. I, I didn't really dive too deep in his torture methods, but we know some of it, uh, or of some of his cruel ways. You know, uh, they're they're so toy box killer esque horrifying. Uh, they may have contributed to the sentences handed down to accomplices David and Wayne. This this won't last long, but but what I have to say for the next few minutes is brutal. So listener beware. This is going to get very very rough. All of Coral's torture methods were gruesome and horrifying, but his use of glass rods. Probably the most sadistic. While torturing a victim on his board, he would routinely, and this is going to be really, really bad. If you want to, if you want to fucking if you skip now, he, he would routinely take a long, thin glass rod and insert it into the urethra of his victim before snapping it off and then sometimes crushing it. You, you heard that right. He would stick a long glass rod inside somebody's pee hole, then break the glass. No anesthesia. That hurts to just think about. I actually will not think about that too hard. When police discovered the torture room after Coral's death, they found a series of broken glass rods littering the floor. Ah! According to Wayne Henley, one of Coral's victims upset the murder so much, the candy man gnawed off his genitals while locked the torture board. Quickly have a new nightmare worse than the glass rod. What an insanely sadistic piece of shit. All because why? Because mama didn't accept who you were? Fuck you. Oh, man, I hate it when people, uh, uh, you know, blame. And, and you know this guy would probably blame everything. Well, it's because, you know, people didn't accept and fucking did it. I wish everybody had to read a book called uh, A Child Called It. There's a book called A Child Called It by Dave Pelter. And after reading it, very hard to feel sorry for yourself. Man, uh, this guy overcame so much and, and never took out all the abuse that happened on him on anyone else. Okay, well, when police finally uh, uh, brought the uh, – or um, – uh, when they finally made it to the boat shed, excuse me, where Coral kept the remains of his victims, they found the penis and testicles of the kid uh, that Dean had chewed on in a plastic bag. And, and adding to the horror, forensic researchers deducted from the size and type of the wounds that the boy's genitals had, in fact, been bitten off in one bite. Fuck. And it sounds like, well, well David uh, was the kid, you know, he groomed to become his assistant. David wasn't the only kid he molested before the murders as well. The Candyman hosted parties for years for boys aged 12 to 14 serving him soda and snacks, get the kids comfortable with him. After gaining their trust, uh, he'd invite them to grown-up parties and then would choose which boys he wanted to rape. And, and later, of course, you know, which boys he'd want to murder. Candyman, truly a monster. Oh, man. Well, we don't get to, you know, ever hear from him what he did, it does, it does feel good that he at least died a violent death. And, and before we recap with today's top five takeaways, this is that information I kept teasing earlier uh, about, about this organization that he, he may have referred to, that he did refer to probably to kind of uh, – you know, keep his uh, apprentices in line. During a separate investigation unrelated to the Candyman killer conducted in March 1975, Houston police discovered a cache of porno uh, pornographic pictures and films depicting young boys. Of the 16 individuals depicted within the files or the films and photos, 11 of the youths appeared to be some of the victims of Dean Coral. This discovery raised the very disturbing possibility that the statements he'd given to both Henley and Brooks prior to his murder about being associated with an organization, an organization that bought and sold boys, may not have actually been bullshit. How scary is that? The discovery of the material in Houston in 75 uh, led to the arrest of five individuals in Santa Clara, California, you know, part of a uh, you know national uh, child sex ring. No direct link to Coral was proven by the arrest. But that might only be because Houston police declined to pursue any possible link to the killings, stating that they felt Coral's victims' families had suffered enough. Fucking Houston police in the 70s, man. Anything they can do to get out of paperwork. No, he's dead, so nah. Look, it's our bowling league season, and we got a lot of bowling to do, so we're not going to pursue this. So disturbing to think that other monsters may have been associated with the Candyman, people who could possibly still be out there today. Uh, and now it is time for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Dean the Candyman Coral believed to have been uh, murdered uh, at least 29 teenage boys in the Houston area between 1970 and 1973. Number two, the Candyman, also known by the press as the Pied Piper because kids used to follow him around hoping to get some of his free candy. Uh, number three, at the time of his death, the Candyman was considered to be the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history, probably only because so many of the probable murders committed by H.H. H. Holmes just could not be proven. Number four, the Candyman rarely worked alone, uh, so additionally disturbing that he convinced two teenage boys, David Owen Brooks, Elmer Wayne Henley, 
uh, Jr. to help him capture, rape, torture, and kill other teenage boys, some of whom were David and Wayne's friends. Uh, and that, uh, beyond those two, he may have actually been part of some horrible national pedophile organization, just further terrifying. And number five, new info, is the 1992 horror movie The Candyman based on Dean Arnold Coral? No, it is not. Uh, the 90s slasher, fic, uh, slasher flick that holds a respectable 70% critical approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, nothing to do with the Houston murders. Uh, that movie's more based on the urban legend of Bloody Mary. Uh, invoke her name, you'll conjure an angry spirit to life. You know, say Candyman five times into the mirror, he comes to slash you with his metal hook hand. The, the movie Candyman is the angry spirit of a former slave who fell in love with the landowner's daughter, was then run down by a lynch mob, cut off his right hand, replaced it with a rusty hook, smeared him with honey, and had bees sting him to death. A little, little bit different than Dean's story. There is a very low-budget Dean Candyman choral movie called In a Madman's World that may have been released to a few art house theaters in uh, 2017. I have no idea where to watch it now. Not on Amazon, not on Netflix, not on YouTube. You can find the trailer on YouTube. Uh, other than that, it's very hard to figure out where you can watch this movie. Crazy that with the cultural appetite for true crime, there are still too many sadistic pieces of shit out there to make movies about all of them. Also crazy that someone decided to make up a horror movie about a killer called The Candyman when there was already a real Candyman way scarier than the dude in the movie. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Candyman has been sucked. Ba-ba. Candyman's over, playboy. Ba-ba. Uh, next uh, 100 episodes, Time Suck has begun. I'm pumped to see where this takes us. Uh, big thanks to the Time Suck team, High Priestess of the Suck, Harmony Velikamp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar, Dobner, Reverend Doctor, Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alex Dugan, the Bit Elixir team, Danger Brain, Space Lizard and Merch Distributor, Axis Apparel, Queen of the Suck and Boss of Damn Near Everything, Lindsay Cummins. Uh, thanks to OG Bojangles Research Assistant, Heather Knowledge Ninja Rylander for kicking this one off. And next week, going in a very different direction. The suck's been a long time coming. Immigration. Let's talk about it. It's overdue. I know, I know. It's, it's an important, you know, it's a, it's a hot topic, polarizing topic, but I'm going to do my best to present a rational depiction of the current immigration dilemma. We'll, you know, we'll address what it takes to become a legal citizen of the United States. We'll suck into the U.S.'s history of uh, immigration, obviously a long history. We'll, we'll talk about the future of immigration. You know, what's realistic? How many citizens of other nations should be allowed in? All? Some? None? Which citizens should be let in? Those who can immediately contribute? Those uh, fleeing oppression and brutality in their native lands? Should that factor into the decision to enter the U.S.? It's going to be a very multifaceted, complex suck that I'm going to do my best to simplify and turn into an entertaining little piece of thought candy. All right. And now I present to you today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker Updates. A lot of messages about the uh, drunk as fuck suck I've been pouring in. Uh, here's one from Tommy Chikatilo, guessing that's maybe not his real name, saying, loved the drunk as fuck episode. Your wife sounds so hot. Please let her join you for some more podcasts. Hail Nimrod. <clears throat> Excuse me. She is hot. She is so hot. She's a good one. I also think her voice is sexy. Uh, she may or may not be the inspiration for Lucifina. Uh, Bill Seaving also wrote in saying, master motherfucking banjo beatboxer. <laughs> Listen to your drunk as fuck suck now, and I just uh, and you just got done screaming loud enough to hurt Lindsay's ears. <laughs> uh, as soon as I opened up the app, I saw that the episode was almost two and a half hours long. I immediately burst out laughing at work and made a bunch of people look at me funny. I knew we were all in for some unplanned hilarity. Had no idea you were going to invite your wife to join in on the fun. I'm not sure you did either. N no, I did not. That was not the intention. Uh, you two were great. It was quite disorganized, and, got, and you got a little inappropriate at times, even for you. I must say, though, the fact that you guys have done such an amazing job of putting well more than 100 quality episodes together before this made this a welcome change of pace and a hilarious twist on an already super funny and entertaining podcast. Thanks a lot for your contribution to my happiness. Keep on sucking, Bill S. Well, thank you, man. I'm glad that I can make you happy. Yeah, shit got crazy. And you know what? Uh, a little tech glitch cost us another 30 minutes. Thank God. It would have been fucking three hours. It's already too long. Well, let's do, let's do one more nice one today from super sucker Jesse Sorensen. Who writes, hey there, Master Sucker. I just wanted to say that the drunk as fuck suck was absolutely outstanding. I love hearing the queen of the suck alongside you. I finally got my wife to listen in on the sucks as well. Now we are both extremely deep in sucking. Mm-hmm. I've also got my friends and family listening. Uh, I can't stop promoting how absolutely outstanding the cult of the curious is. Very proud to be part of the sucking union. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I'm a former firefighter who was injured, oh man, in the line of duty and can no longer do what I love. Sorry, man. 
Coming across this sucks has done wonders for my life, believe it or not. I miss having a brotherhood, a family like I had when I fought fire, and now becoming a faithful space lizard member of the cult of the curious. It has given me a sense of brotherhood again, a sense of family. And uh, through a lot of shit that I've dealt with in my life and still deal with, like I was diagnosed with PTSD, depression, anxiety, survivor's guilt, insomnia, man, a list of other uh, bullshit disorders, but I can always rely on the suck to calm me down and help me get through it. I could not imagine going on without the suck. Oh, dude, that's fucking crazy, man. That's, that's awesome. Everything you do means a lot to this family, the cult. And I believe I speak for every member when I say thank you so fucking much for everything you do. You really have no idea how much this helps, not just me, but everybody else. You have created something truly fucking amazing, goddamn magical, if you will. I never expected a podcast to do what this one has done. It is truly exceptional and different from everything else in the world. <laughs> I look for Baba, player, player. I like what you're saying, player, Baba. You mean like that kind of stuff makes it weird? I look forward to the future of the suck. And again, extremely proud to be part of what you've created. My dark humor is not accepted uh, by a lot of people. Ah, fucking, I hear you there, man. But of course, that is the one thing that helps me get through the pain. That you and the family understand it, and I finally feel accepted again. Keep on sucking, master. I don't expect to shout out, well, you got one. But I do want you to know how amazing you are and everything you've done in uh, my life. You kept, kept me going, keep me happy, make me laugh. Well, I don't want to keep my, uh, when I don't want to keep my head above the water. My wife, myself, my friends, our, our blood family, uh, also extremely grateful also want to add that not only is this podcast at standing, but I fucking love your stand-up as well. That's nice, man. Hysterical. Keeps me going. Yours truly, Jesse motherfucking Sorensen, a.k.a. Magical Motherfucker, out of Hot Atlanta, a.k.a. Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you again. P.S. Want to pass on my nickname to you. <laughs> and from, uh, from now forth, I'll refer to you as the Master Sucker Prophet of Nimrod Magical Motherfucking Cummins. And I hate to keep going on, but I also suck. Uh, I'm shitty at spelling. Me too, man. Me too. So don't mind any fuck ups there. Thank God for voice control and it's helped a lot. <laughs> Laugh my ass off. Damn it, man. This is why I keep going, Jesse. Thank you so much. That's why I keep pulling the late nights. You know, so this is why I feel guilty for not doing enough. You know, I've been so frustrated. I've, God has been hard to find time to finish the beta testing on the latest app stuff. I feel like such an asshole, but, but I, I keep staying up too long working on other stuff with this. It's become an obsession with me, man. It's, uh, it's become a, such a fun community for me too. I actually just told my agent that I'm not taking as much stand up work next year. I mean, I'm still going to tour. I know that you like my stand. I'm still going to create new stuff, but I just, not, not as much. Not as much as this year because I want to focus more on this. I want to focus on this community. Uh, I feel like you guys are better than what I deserve and I wish I could spend, you know, more time on it to make it even more enjoyable. It's too fun. And, uh, and for the record, I know that some of you did not enjoy listening to me get sloppy drunk and that's totally fine. You didn't like hearing the dogs run around. You don't want me having a co-host. Well, I, I hope you felt today that the suck was back on track. Back what you expected it to be. And, and, and I'll leave you with one last, <laughs> <laughs> silly update. Funny sucker Josh Valentine wrote in uh, saying simply, shut the fuck up about your banjo. God damn it. Suck on. Uh, <laughs> agreed, Josh. Agreed. But it is so much fun to do banjo solos. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. You, you got to admit, out of the banjo solos, that one might have been, might have been the best. I do have, a, I think I have some talent, talent. That's all for today, suck faithful. Don't be a child molesting, handed out candy, van driving, torture board making, piece of shit creep. Uh, instead of that, how about I throw out this? How about you instead just keep on sucking? Oh, shit.